two, one. Operating systems. An operating system is essentially a piece of software that manages hardware, like your RAM and software like your programs, but nowadays this has become a little more than that, as they are even part of our identity. We like to customize them and automate them. I'd like to thank Android, R slash Linux Master Race, Sam Henry Gold, U Experience 0904, U Effective Luck 3514, undefined and everyone that contributed for making this possible. By the way, feel free to react to this video, I include the sources in the description below. This video only has educational and entertainment purposes, I don't like it but I probably will have to censor some things as you know how YouTube is. If I commit any mistakes, which is pretty likely, or if I miss something, let me know in the comments, I always heard them. Well, I think that you can notice that ever since late 2021, I've been kind of obsessed with this topic because it is just interesting as hell. So this video will be the conclusion of everything that I've researched until now, featuring corrections, new details, and exclusive entries. Let's dive deep into the operating system's iceberg. OS Marketer According to StatCounter, this year in the desktop space, the most popular operating system is Windows with 75% of the market share. The next one is macOS with 15%, following with Linux having 2.77%, Chrome OS with 2.48%, and FreeBSD has 0.01%. In the mobile world, Android has 71% and iOS 27%. It lists Samsung as having 0.34%, but I guess that's just Android, leaving 0.07% to KaiOS and 0.02% to Windows. Windows 10 is still the most popular version of Windows, macOS Catalina or Big Sur are the most popular macOS versions, as there seems to be an error when getting the data, Android 12 is the most popular version version for Google OS, and Android is also the most popular operating system ever, and iOS 15.6 is the most popular version for this OS. According to Red Hat, Linux has 68%, Windows 31%, and Unix 0.3% of the server market share. Apple Founded by Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Ronald Wayne on April 1st, 1976, it is one of the most popular and influential tech companies of all time. It was the first company to be valued at over $1 trillion in August 2018. Enjoyed. Android is an open source operating system written in Java, focused primarily on touchscreen devices like phones, tablets, smartwatches, etc. Its first release was back on September 23rd of 2008, made by Andy Rubin, Rich Miner, Nick Sears, and Chris White. In 2005, Google acquired the company and has been working on the project ever since, with the latest version being Android 13. It was called this way due to its creator, Andy Rubin, who his nickname was Android. Windows Microsoft Windows is a desktop computer operating system introduced back in 1985. It was designed to display graphical elements and squared, movable and resizable components called Windows, hence the OSS name. The latest version is Windows 11. It features a refined flint design with a center taskbar, a new stored menu and rounded corners, leaving behind the little bits of Metro UI tiles that the previous version had. It also introduces a new widgets panel, snap groups, and Android application support, even though that last one kinda sucks. An earlier build was leaked some time before the official announcement of the system that let us test some of the new features. 
I actually made a video about it. There is a controversy with the requirements for this system as it needs a 64-bit processor with 1 gigahertz and 2 cores, 4 gigabytes of RAM and 64 gigabytes of storage. They do not seem to be very demanding requirements until you read that you have to have a CPU with the second version of a trusted platform module or TPM. Only processors that came out in recent years include this, making slightly older processors like an Intel Core of 7th generation or an AMD Ryzen of 1st generation and not compatible. Some people think that Windows 11 is actually a fusion of the now cancelled Windows 10X and the Sun Valley update. Windows 10X was a special version of Windows 10 made specifically for dual screen computers. In this edition, we could already find things like a center taskbar and a new stored menu. I think there is a really big possibility for this to be true. Apple Products the Apple II brought the concept of a computer to mass adoption with the term of a personal computer. Keep in mind that in that time, computers were very expensive and targeted at big corporations. The Macintosh computers were one of the first ones to introduce the concept of a graphical user interface or GUI. This is the standard nowadays, but back then, it was completely revolutionary. The reviews were mixed as it had poor performance, a decision caused by trying to lower the cost as much as possible. Jobs was fired, but returned later to the company in 1997 with the acquisition of Next. The next year, Apple introduced the first iMac, an all-in-one computer with a very interesting translucent design, USB ports and internet connectivity via Ethernet. This made it a complete success. Currently, it has other models like the Mac Mini, which is only the computer but without any display nor peripherals, but cheaper, the Mac Studio that is like a Mac Mini but with better specs and higher price, the Mac Pro that also is the Burr computer, but this one is modular and the most expensive and powerful one in the iMac Pro that's a better version of the all-in-one iMac. In 1999, the company introduced the iBook, a laptop that later became the MacBook, with a more powerful variation called the MacBook Pro and a cheaper and lighter model called the MacBook Air. In 2000, Apple bought the SoundJam MP audio player software, which would be an essential tool for the success of their next product the iPod, that also has variations, being these the iPad Shuffle, that had no screen, the iPad Nano, a smaller version of the original one, and the iPod Touch, that only has a home button, and you can install apps to it. All of these products led to the creation of Apple's biggest product, the iPhone. It combined a phone, a media player, and a web browser, but nowadays, 14 iterations later, it can be described as more of a portable computer, because the creation of the App Store expanded a lot its capabilities, allowing you to watch videos, play games, and even edit media. The Apple TV was also introduced, that is a device that lets you stream content and play compatible games. In 2010, Apple unveiled the iPad, a larger brother to the iPhone that was also compatible with its apps. There are also other models, like the iPad Pro, with better specs and larger size, the iPad Mini, which is smaller and cheaper, and the iPad Air that is lighter. In 2014, Apple announced the Apple Watch that it was a complement to the iPhone and also a fitness tracker. This one also has other versions like a cheaper Apple Watch SE or the Apple Watch Ultra that has better tracking and resistance. In 2016, alongside the iPhone 7, Apple released the AirPods, a pair of Bluetooth earbuds, successors of the EarPods. The AirPods Pro are a revision that feature noise cancellation, and the AirPods Max are more expensive over the ear headphones. 
In 2017, the HomePod was announced. It is a smart speaker that lets you listen to music, podcasts, and use Siri, its voice assistant. It was very expensive, so it didn't sell that well, leading to the creation of a cheaper and colorful version called the HomePod Mini. The latest Apple product is the AirTag a tracking device that works with the Find My network that gets location reports from Apple devices being very effective in places where people with iPhones are the majority. Google Play Services As I previously mentioned, Android is open source but it has some really important proprietary or closed source components called the Google Play Service Server or GMS. Most Android phones have them by default and some apps even need them to work properly. As examples, you have the Google Play Store, Google Apps including Gmail, YouTube, Google Maps, Google Drive, Google Photos and Chrome and some other ones that you don't notice at first glance like the Firebase API which handles databases, telemetry and notifications for apps hosted on Google servers. These services also take care of handling payments, giving exposure notifications, showing ads, and providing the AR libraries for some apps with AR Core. Even though practically all phones have Google Play services, if you were a new phone company, you would have to comply with Google's conditions for implementing them. Phone Companies there are and there have been multiple Android phone companies, it is truly a very complicated market. I'm just going to mention the most popular ones and their main lineups. Samsung is one of the top, if not the top manufacturer in the world, mainly known for its Galaxy lineup. Next, we have Xiaomi, known for its Go Valley phones with sub-brands like Redmi and Poco. Then we have Huawei, a brand that has lost a lot of popularity due to its US ban, but we'll talk about it later. Its main lineups are Mate and P. Moving on, we have Oppo with its Reno series, also Xiaomi's competition, Realme with the self-titled and GT series, we can't forget about the favorite one of a lot of you, and that's OnePlus with the self-titled and Nord series, Google itself that makes some very mother friendly and stock phones, only having their Pixel lineup, previously called Nexus, another brand is Motorola having its G and H series. HTC was a giant some years ago, but they have slowly faded out. Still, I think they deserve a mention. LG recently moved away from the phone market, but I think we all can agree that they had some very interesting phones with the LG series. And the new brand that everyone's talking about, Nothing, that just released the Nothing Phone 1 with a pretty unique design and some close to stock software. Apple Stores it is said that part of Apple's marketing strategy is to build a lot of Apple stores instead of using traditional ads. That's why you always have an Apple store in every mall and near you, where you can try the new products and acquire them. iOS Originally called iPhone OS, this is the operating system that iPhones and iPod Touches run, and the one that iPads also ran before having a dedicated OS. What most people didn't know is that originally this was described as quote OS X. The truth is that it's a Unix-like system based on Darwin, a type of BSD, with a hybrid Chinook kernel. Surprisingly, both Darwin and Chinu are open source, but iOS isn't. iPhone OS 1 included a multi-touch based interface with apps based on common utilities. iPhone OS 2 introduced the App Store that allowed you to download apps for your phone iPhone OS 3 added a system-wide clipboard to copy and paste stuff and allowed you to record videos with the iPhone 3GS. The now called iOS 4 supported custom wallpapers and multitasking. The fifth major release, iOS 5, added the notification center. iOS 6 replaced Google Maps with Apple Maps. With iOS 7, we saw a major redesign, moving from a skeuomorphic design to a flat design, along with the introduction of the control center. 
iOS 8 synced to iPhone and other Apple devices with the feature called Continuity, and the Health app was added. The Apple News app was included with iOS 9 as well as a blue light filter mode called Night Shift. iOS 10 used the new home app to manage your smart devices, and the lock screen was improved. The lock screen and notification center were combined on iOS 11, and the control center was redesigned. Thanks to iOS 12, you can now see your screen time and perform quick actions with the Shortcuts app. In iOS 13, a system-wide dark mode was included, and the annoying volume pop-up was also redesigned. With iOS 14, you're getting a new app library with all your apps, as well as home screen widgets iOS 15 introduced focus modes that adapt your home screen and notifications according to the mode you're in. The latest version is iOS 16 that redesigned the lock screen to allow more customization and always on display. Bugjoid if you've used the Android, you have definitely seen it. It is the green and white Android's mascot. Now, the Bugjoid name is actually an unofficial one, but it is the name some Android devs used to refer to this character, so it's the closest thing that we have to an actual name. But do you know that Bugjoid was not the first option for a logo? Meet the Dandroids, the first sketch for an Android mascot. These look very different and even a little unsettling, but that's just my opinion. Irina Block, the creator of Bugjoid, said that she looked at the universal signs for the male and female public restrooms and she imagined a robot version of them. It is said that she probably also took inspiration from a character also called Android from an Atari Lynx title called Gauntlet The Third Encounter. They surely do look a lot similar, but as far as I know, Google hasn't said anything about it. The Android's logo has changed over the years, with mainly subtle modifications to the green tone. However, when Android 10 was introduced, Google opted for a cleaner version with just the head and a colder tone of the green. I personally love this new redesign. The green robot has also appeared as an easter egg in several games, exclusively for the Android version of Jetpack Joyride and Crozy Road as a playable character, and Sonic Dash, also as a limited time playable character, and Terraria as a pet that can be summoned with an item called the Shiny Black Slab. The game Cookie Run also has a reference to Android, with the character Cookie Droid that, as a fun fact, has a Google Play themed pet and dislikes the Apple Cookie. You probably also didn't know that a real life Android statue Gordon exists in Mountain View, where you can see statues of Bug Droid themed according to the version that they represent, like a gingerbread, ice cream sandwich, and marshmallow statues. As a fun fact, you can find in the internet collectible bug droid toys, but there are real Android-themed candies too. For example, in 2013, Google partnered with Nestlé to send 500 limited edition bug droids made of chocolate to announce their OS update. In the Google I.O. of 2012, Google gave some of their visitors a Bugger jelly bean container to match with the update of that year. Finally, in the Google I.O. of 2017, people were given actual Bugger themed Oreo cookies. I think we all have liked to eat these. Weirdly, there are people that have made Bugger Halloween costumes, like what you're seeing right now. Maybe we should try it sometime. Android vs. iOS in the desktop world, the rivalry is between Windows, Mac, and Linux, but in the mobile space, it is Android versus iOS because they're the two main phone OSs. People that are in favor of iOS claim that it is a more secure, private, and reliable platform. Meanwhile, the people that prefer Android is usually because they prefer a more open ecosystem with more choice for devices and programs. I think both operating systems have pros and cons, but personally, I prefer Android. Android Skins 
Android is open source, which means that everyone can make their modifications to the code and create their own versions. This is what most big brands have done, creating what is called an Android skin, as it mostly only changes some visual aspects, but some of them include cool features not available in the so-called stock version of Android. An example of this is the ability to turn apps into floating windows, a desktop mode and replacing some of the default apps. Some of the heaviest skins, meaning the ones with the most amount of changes, to the point where some could be considered as bloatware or Samsung's One UI that makes its own design using blur, moving pop-ups to the bottom of the screen for better reachability, but also adding a good amount of customization, features, and compatibility with their ecosystem. We have Xiaomi's MIUI that actually started as a custom ROM and now is heavily inspired by iOS with modifications like the separated quick settings and notifications panel, super wallpapers, and a gaming mode. Next, we have MUI, Huawei's Android skin that even if they are stopping to use it in certain devices, it does change quite some stuff. It is also inspired by iOS with similar icons including the shape, and as far as I know, they don't even have an app drawer. A very unknown one for some people is Funtouch OS, Vivo's skin, that has its own design and again adds little changes like improvements to the always on display, a custom game mode, and floating apps. Then we have Oppo's Color OS that tries to not add too many features but still modifying stuff to make it more useful and customizable, as you can change your accent color, font, and even icon pack. Then, let's mention Oxygen OS that was one of the most loved Android skins ever. It featured a close to stock Android base, with a couple of subtle customizations and added features that Android didn't have back then. Now, Oxygen OS and Realme UI are both based on Color OS, which makes them very similar to the one previously mentioned. In fact, it is very hard to tell them apart sometimes. A lot of people got angry and disappointed with this move as Oppo now owns OnePlus and seems to be losing its identity, but that is another topic. Reaching the more stock Android skins, we have of course Google's Pixel UI. This is basically the standard for how a vanilla skin should be, follows material design, has the latest updates, and adds a couple of Pixel exclusive features like free Google Photos storage, magic eraser, and the now playing music auto detection features. Motorola also has its own mini Android skin, which a lot of people don't really know that has a name, that is MyUX. It adds mainly only exclusive Motorola gestures like doing a chopping motion twice to toggle the flashlight or flipping your phone over to enable do not disturb. Nothing OS has also a few changes, being the main ones to customize the glyph lights on the back of your nothing phone, a custom font and a big circle and the quick settings that grips your network tiles. I would like to know which Android skin is your favorite one and why. I personally love stuck Android but I don't mind a few customizations here and there, like what ColorOS or MyUX do. Apple Memes There are a lot of memes that are directly or indirectly related to Apple and its products. I'm going to mention them briefly because they are a lot. One of the most recent ones is the 1984 Macintosh ad meme. The context behind it is that there is a novel called 1984 which tells us the story of a dystopian dictatorship where everyone is brainwashed. Kind of like our world but worse. Apple released this ad for the Macintosh that became iconic, implying that 1984, as the novel tells us, wouldn't happen in our world because of Apple's innovation with the Mac. Nowadays, this commercial is used in memes to represent satirical forbidden situations, like this meme that says, <laughs> Sir, those toilets are for display purposes only implying that there is no freedom and comparing it to the 1984 novel. Another popular meme is that Apple has overpriced products, which is a fact. People say that when you buy an Apple product, you pay the quote, Apple tax. Some people justify the price of its products because they claim that they are high because they don't sell your data. Think that I don't really believe. <laughs> 
The best example of overpriced products is the Display XDR stand that costs alone a thousand dollars. Yes, just the stand. <laughs> a frequent complaint is that this company doesn't innovate anymore, something that I think we've all have noticed. Practically, the iPhone has remained the same since the iPhone X, with just a couple of new features. Along with the lack of innovation memes, there is the usual meme that complains not only about Apple not innovating, but about Apple removing features like the headphone jack, the MacBook ports which are back now but only for the Pro models, the charging brick removal and the possible removal of a charging port. A meme format that I think was exaggerated is the one that appeared when the iPhone 4, 5, and 6 came out, that were slightly bigger. Considering how big Android phones and the iPhone Pro Max are now, I would love to have an iPhone with a big iPhone 6 size, just without bezels. One that was also iconic and popular back in the day was what happened if you asked Siri, the iPhone's voice assistant, what is zero divided by zero? Who replies? Imagine that you have zero cookies and you split them evenly among zero friends. How many cookies does each person get? See, it doesn't make sense, and Cookie Monster is sad that there are no cookies and you are sad that you have no friends, like me. A stereotype that iPhones have is that they have a poor battery life. This was real a couple of years ago, but right now, iPhones are probably the phones with best battery life in the market due to their optimization and lack of Google Play services, but to this day, this reputation still exists and there are tons of memes to prove it. The last meme we're going to mention is the one caused by the NFT lover Donald Trump that also happens to have been a US president. In one of his conferences, he referred to Tim Cook as Tim Apple, probably because he forgot his name. Tim Apple didn't seem so bothered by this, changing his Twitter name to what Donald called him. Apple Event Every year, the Cupertino's company makes at least one public event, but generally there are multiple of them each year. One that takes place each summer is the Worldwide Developers Conference or WWDC, where new versions of iOS, macOS, and watchOS are announced, and sometimes there are hardware announcements too. There is also the classic September Apple event where new iPhones are introduced. It is common to have more events or keynotes to introduce other devices like iPads and MacBooks. Android releases There are different types of Android releases. We have main releases, for example from Android 12 to Android 13, minor releases like going from Android 3.0 to 3.1, tablet releases like Android 12L, and security patches that should be a monthly security and stability update independent from your Android version. Let's list all of them quickly. Starting with Android 1.0 that came out in September of 2008 and introduced the Android market, a predecessor to the Play Store, folders and the home screen, and had Google apps like Gmail, Google Contacts, Maps, Talk, Search, and YouTube. Its successor, Android 1.1 Petit 4, released the next year, had a few improvements like details and reviews for businesses and maps, the ability to save attachments in messages, and filters in the camera and photos app. Android 1.5 Cupcake in late 2009 introduced support for widgets, video recording, and playback for MPEG4 format, 
stereo support for Bluetooth, and the ability to upload videos to YouTube. Android 1.6 Donut, released only a couple of months after its previous version, allowed users to select multiple photos to delete them, introduced support for WVGA screen resolutions, and redesigned the Android market. It is believed that the beta dessert name for this version could originally be Donut Burger. The next version, called Android 2.0 Eclair, came out again months after the previous release, still in 2009. It added compatibility with HTML5, auto brightness, and live wallpapers. In 2010, a 2.1 revision came out with the addition of Pinch to Zoom, a full screen app drawer, and revamped apps. Months later, Android 2.2 Frojo, short for Frozen Yogurt, came out. Some believe that it was originally going to be called Flan. It featured USB tethering and Wi-Fi hotspot functionality, as well as support for numeric and alphanumeric passwords. Then, in late 2010, we saw Android 2.3 Gingerbread, with copy-paste functionality, support for NFC and multiple cameras on a single device. The first Android release focused on tablets was Android 3.0 Honeycomb, released in early 2011. It had a redesign with a holographic-like interface, a system bar merged the navigation buttons and the status bar. Even though this version was only made for tablets, some people have gotten it to work on an Nexus One that was the phone. Some refinements were made with 3.1 and 3.2, like adding USB connectivity, support for joysticks and gamepads, and increased compatibility with more devices. The next year, 2011, Android 4.0 Ice Cream Sandwich was announced, with the new Roboto phone, hardware acceleration, and resizable widgets. Succeeded in 2012 by Android 4.1 Jelly Bean, phones running this version were now able to use Android Beam. Overall, it received many improvements to the speed of the OS. It is rumored that the beta name for this version was Jandy Kane. 4.2 and 4.3 were minor updates to Jelly Bean that added features like gesture typing, SE Linux, OpenGL3, and 4K resolution support. The following major release was in 2013 with Android KitKat, originally named Keyline Pi. It now required less RAM, showed a full screen artwork when the device is locked, and implemented immersive mode that disables the system and status bars. It is the oldest Android version Google encourages developers to support. 2014's Android 5.0 and 5.1 Lollipop, internally codenamed as Lemon Meringue Pie, simplified the three navigation buttons to the simple shapes we now know. It was the first version to implement material design with a card-based UI. 2015 would see the creation of Android 6.0 Marshmallow, internally codenamed as Macadamia Nut Cookie. It introduced a new feature called Doze that will turn Android apps off if the device has not been moving for some time to save battery. It now allowed you to use Android Pay and USB-C connections. We're getting close to modern Android with 2016's Android 7 Nougat, internally codenamed as New George Cheesecake. It featured a native split-screen mode and a data saver. Moving on with the 2017 release, Android 8.0 and 8.1 Oreo with the internal codename of Oatmeal Cookie added a native picture-in-picture -picture mode, notifications newsing, and notification channels. In 2018, we would get Android 9 Pie, internally codenamed as Pistachio Ice Cream. It revamped the quick settings menu and the traditional navigation system with the two-button navigation that used one button to go to the home screen, and swiping that same button would get you to the overview. When necessary, the back button would appear. The following year, 2019, Android 10 would come out, officially dropping the dessert names, but they are still used internally, so it is Android 10, Queen Cake, or Queen Start. It was the base for modern Android, with very important additions like the gesture navigation and system-wide dark theme. 2020's release, Android 11 Red Velvet Cake, would focus more on improving the system, 
with a new power menu that combined the power options, home controls, and Google Pay and merged the media player with the quick settings panel. We also got finally a native screen recorder. For 2021, we got one of the biggest updates in the entire history of Android with Android 12, introducing an updated design language called Material U, Universal Device Search, and a gaming dashboard. We also saw the first tablet-focused update in a long time with Android 12L or 12.1 that added a taskbar and improved large device support. With this in mind, it was not really a surprise to see though that 2022 update Android 13 to Ramizu was not that big, including a new photo picker and enhancements to Material U, like the new progress bars and theme icon support for third-party apps. If you have not noticed the pattern, the letters follow the alphabetical order, so next year's release will be Android 14 U, rumored to be codenamed as Upside Down Cake. Android for Smart Devices as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, Android is not only an OS for smartphones as it can run on smart devices too. For TVs, we have Android TV that optimizes its resources and UI to be better experienced with a remote. Most TVs already come with a pre-installed, but for those that don't, there are usually sticks or boxes that connect to your HDMI input connection and convert it into a smart device with Android. One person that I know got one of these boxes but instead of running android tv it ran just android with a custom launcher so it was interesting to note that it recognized the box as if it was a tablet and if you were wondering yes you could siloed apps and because it is android you could technically also run android tv apps on your phone they obviously won't be properly optimized for it speaking about smart watches let's introduce android wear now just called wear os it really hasn't been that popular comparing it to Apple's watchOS, but they both share the same goal of making a watch more connected and useful. You can install apps to it if they support it, and it basically behaves as an extension of your phone with the new version of Wear OS and the Pixel Watch. People expect this OS to finally be more mainstream, but we'll see. Finally, let's mention Android Auto. It is a mode that gets activated when you connect with a cable or wirelessly your phone to your supported car. You will be able to control stuff like the music that is playing, the GPS navigation, and reply to messages through Google Assistant. It tries to be useful but avoiding being distracting. Apple CEOs Steve Jobs was the first Apple CEO but it was not the only one, even though definitely the most influential one. After hiring John Scully, it was decided that Jobs should be let go due to him making very expensive decisions, making Scully the next CEO. He worked 10 years in Apple, but was succeeded by Michael Spindler, that lasted 3 years in the company, followed by Jill Amelio, who thought of bringing Jobs back to the company, only lasting a year as CEO. After Jobs' death, Tim Cook became CEO of Apple, starting a new era for the company. Designed by Apple in California This is a very common phrase in Apple products. It has become so iconic that it is also the name of a very expensive book where the company describes the process of making their devices. Windows Update it is a service that takes care of downloading an update in the background, then installs it on your computer and it's built in since Vista. Since Windows 10, it also takes care of updating your drivers. A lot of people still hate it because it forced the updates and restarted your system. Well, it still kinda does that even when you were using your PC. Also, sometimes the system restarts took hours to finish. It has improved a little bit with an option to Pause the updates for 7 days, as well as a smarter restart schedule to avoid restarting at active hours. Still, I think they shouldn't force you to update. Android Easter eggs with every new major version of Android, if you tap several times on the Android version, you will get a new page with an interactive easter egg referencing the dessert name or the features of your current version. I will show you all of them quickly. 
Okay. The first version to include an easter egg was Android 2.3 Gingerbread that just showed this picture of bug droid with a zombie gingerbread and Android 3.0 Honeycomb that was exclusive to tablets we only got like a blue bug droid B and that's it. An ice cream sandwich if we long press this it'll grow and then we have this little animation that reminds me of Nyan Cat. In Android 4.3 Jelly Bean, we have this jelly bean and if we long press it, we get a bunch of floating jelly beans. In Android 4.4 Kit Cat, we have this K that if we press a couple of times, will show us this Android Kit Cat theme logo. And if we long press it, we'll get this mosaic of different Android versions. Kind of reminds me of Windows 8. <laughs> In Android 5 Lollipop, we have, well, a lollipop that if we tap on it, will change its color. If we long press it, it will show us this minigame of Bugjoid Flappy Bird. In Android 5 Lollipop as a beta, the easter egg was different. Originally it showed a bunch of rectangles of red and blue colors and that was a clear reference to WebDriver Torso, a Google channel that became very popular because it was very weird. I recommend you to look that up, uh, it's kind of interesting. In Android 6 Marshmallow, we get a marshmallow that if we long press will bring us again to a similar minigame to the bug droid flappy bird but with marshmallows with android 7 nougat we get this n it's actually one of the most interesting easter eggs if we tap seven times and then long press it we can enable or disable a cat easter egg now i've enabled it and let's go to the quick settings let's edit it here it appears this little treat that we can empty the dish or select different dishes like beds fish chicken or treat and well what this basically does is it acts kind of like a food that will attract a cat. It could take minutes or hours, I really don't know how long it actually takes, but when a cat arrives, you will see a notification that says that a cat arrived, and if you tap on it, you will be able to share that cat, but that's basically it. In Android 8 Oreo, we have an Oreo again. If we tap it several times and then long press it, we will get this squid that looks kind of like myself with no will to live. <laughs> and we can drag it and move it around and that's basically it. For Android 9 Pi, it actually changes a little bit because if we press on this, this dialog was not here before and now we have to press again several times there and if we tap on this the p will change its color and if we tap several times on it it will bring us to this uh, drawing app with android 10 we get this uh, android 10 logo and if we press it we can rotate stuff so our goal is to make a Q like this and now if we press several times on the Q we will be able to access this that I think it's called a nonogram. So basically uh, it's a puzzle that you have to complete and when you complete it you will get a shape. I'm not gonna complete this one because I'm lazy so let's see the next one. In Android 11, we have this dial that you have to rotate all the way. 
If you achieve that in the first try, I'm jealous. Android 12's easter egg shows us this clock and we have 2.212. These material U bubbles appear, and in Android 13, we have to do the same thing, but now pointing towards where 13 would be. And if we long press, we will get different types of emojis. Product Red. This is a special red version of products that became a tradition. When you buy one of these, you are donating to the fight against diseases like AIDS or COVID. iPad OS iPad OS is a fork of iOS that takes full advantage of all the screen real estate and power of the iPads introducing exclusive features being separated of the iOS branch in 2019 with the release of iPadOS 13.1 that had more rows and columns of apps on the home screen and featured a new multitasking system. iOS 14 now had the ability to mount encrypted external drives. Other interfaces like series are now compact allowing you to interact with the content in the background. For some reason, the widgets couldn't be placed on the home screen until the release of iOS 15 that also introduced the app library from iOS. In iPadOS 16, you now have the weather app and a new window managing feature known as Stage Manager. Widgets Widgets are miniaturized applications and you can find them in various operating systems like in macOS, iOS, Android, or Windows. In Windows 11, the widgets have a dedicated panel that, to be fair, nobody really uses, though it's expected to get a third-party support. macOS Also being proprietary but based on the open-source Chinook kernel and next up, also falling in the category of BSD and the successor of the classic Mac OS. I'm just going to mention the versions of OS X because if I also mention the versions of Next Step and System or classic Mac OS, it's gonna take a long time. Well, starting with OS X Cheetah in 2001, named after being the 10th release of the Mac OS. This first version introduced the dock and the terminal, but was met with pretty harsh reviews as it was slow and incomplete, but some other praised this move as the Mac OS needed a big overhaul. It had a few apps, but it was a completely new code base. Mac OS 10.1 Puma improved the overall performance and added missing features like DVD playback support. Its successor, 10.2 Jaguar, added cups, MPEG-4 support in QuickTime, etc. macOS 10.3 Panther replaced Internet Explorer with Safari. The Finder had a redesign and more features, as well as introducing the feature Expose that shows all your windows as thumbnails. Next, we have macOS 10.4 Tiger that now included Spotlight, a new version of Safari, and Dashboard, a panel with multiple widgets. The sixth major release, 10.5 Leopard, had a redesigned dock with stacks and a tweaked menu bar. The following version, 10.6 Snow Leopard, had almost no new features because they wanted to focus on improving what they already had with better performance and efficiency. OS X Lion introduced the Mac App Store, where you can download your software and updates. 10.8 Mountain Lion gained a new malware blocking system called Gatekeeper and brought the notification center to the desktop. Desktop OS. OS 10.9 Mavericks was the beginning of a transition to another age of Mac OS as it dropped the big cat code names, became free, and removed some skeuomorphic elements from the UI. The big redesign happened in OS 10.10 .10, Yosemite. 
that adopted a flat design with blur in some areas to match with iOS 7. OS 10.11 El Capitan added the option to split windows by holding on the green button and made it easier to find your cursor by shaking it, which would cause it to grow. Mac OS 10.12 Sierra brings Siri to your Mac as well as Night Shift. The next release, macOS 10.13 High Sierra, added support for Apple's graphic API Metal 2 and set the Apple file system as the default file system. macOS 10.14 Mojave added a dark mode and accent colors and got iOS apps like News, Stocks, Voice Memos, and Home. 10.15 Catalina was controversial because it removed compatibility with 32-bit apps and replaced Bash with the C shell. macOS 11 Big Sur finally dropped the 10.x naming scheme, making notable the big changes the update had, like a redesigned UI, the control center, and support for ARM processors. The 18th major release was macOS 12 Monterey that ported shortcuts and test flight to the Mac. The latest macOS release is 13 Ventura and added weather and clock for the Mac and a new window managing feature called Stage Manager. Watch OS. Now let's mention the Apple Watch's operating system, Watch OS. It is based on iOS and can run apps made with the WatchKit API. The first version showed us its different home screen that has floating circular app icons that can be zoomed in and out with the digital crown. Its second version included now support for third-party apps. The third release lets you add your favorite apps to the dock switch to another watch face with a swipe and swiping up brings the control center. In watchOS 4, you can find a redesigned music app, toggles for the flashlight and safety light in the control center, and a news app. watchOS 5 added the walkie-talkie feature that lets you communicate between Apple Watches instantly. In the next version, a calculator and the App Store were included. In 2020, watchOS 7 comes out with hand washing and sleep tracking. watchOS 8 had improvements to the health monitoring, visuals, and apps. The latest version is watchOS 9 and has a compass app and a new low power mode. tvOS Based on iOS, the last and least known Apple operating system left for us to cover is tvOS. The initial release was in 2015 and called tvOS 9. It had a transparent and light UI with support for the new remote that controls everything with a trackpad. Interestingly, it seems that it was the first Apple OS to implement a tuggable dark mode back in 2016 with tvOS 10. In tvOS 11, support for 4K output was included. The following year, tvOS 12 came out with support for third-party remotes. A UI overhaul was made in tvOS 13, adding rounder corners and full-screen video previews. Picture-in-picture -picture for third-party apps was introduced with tvOS 14, as well as a redesigned control center. tvOS 15 can now be controlled via a HomePod and has a redesigned player. Finally, tvOS 16 redesigned the Siri UI and supports now the Switch's joy Icons and Pro Controllers. Tier 2 Apple Park This is the name given to the current headquarters for Apple and where most events take place. Android Memes it surprises me that the Android community doesn't seem to have a lot of memes compared to the Linux community but it does have some. Probably the most popular one is very relatable as we all have faced an ad of some mobile game or app whose X is just 
too small or it's just a plain fake one. This is done on purpose to increase the chances of us going to their Play Store page and most of the times they achieve it. I think it only hurts its reputation but well. Next we have the Android camera quality memes that basically bash Android users for supposedly having inferior cameras to the iPhone. I mean they probably meant Android users with a low end device because if we compare the flagship Android cameras, they really don't look any worse than what Apple has to offer. They are right in some way as Android's cameras tend to look worse than third party apps, but that deserves its own entry. Let me tell you about the next meme, it's just one sentence. Galaxy Nexus Android Ice Cream Sandwich Gnaw Pig. If you didn't get it, which is very likely, it was the confusing headline of a CNET review article for the Galaxy Nexus phone, implying that it was a test device for Android ice cream sandwich. It became popular because, at first glance, the sentence doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Claim an Android version before someone else takes it was a TikTok trend where people would do the thing previously mentioned with a random video, not much to add. Android 13 Installer was another meme TikTok trend where people would show a suspicious low quality Android 13 Installer and when they pressed on the install button, their device would get bricked. Finally, we have the Wii Phone. This was taken from a video from 2008 that showed concepts for next generation consoles. One of them was the Wii Phone. The video now just screams late 2000s with the PowerPoint presentation style, Comic Sans font and the music. That is why it became a meme and someone actually made a Wii Phone themed app, making the Wii Phone a real thing. Samsung Galaxy Note 7 Explosion Samsung released the Galaxy Note 7 back on August 19th, 2016. It was the successor to the Galaxy Note 5, with features like expendable storage, IP68 water resistance, a curved display, a stylus, and it was powered by an octa-core Exynos 8890 with 4GB of RAM. A good phone back then, but it had one big issue, and that was the battery. More specifically, there wasn't enough room between the heat-sealed protective pouch around the battery and its internals, that could cause electrodes inside each battery to crimp. This, along with having thin separators, increased the risks of separator damage and short circuit. It led to some batteries overheating, setting on fire and exploding. Airports and other places started banning these phones as they could cause some accidents. And until today, it is remembered as one of the biggest Samsung failures. Apple Controversies Mentioning Apple itself is controversial, but there have been some well-justified controversies this company has been involved in. The one we hear about every year is that they copy features from other phones or operating systems. For example, widgets on the home screen are a feature that Android has had for years, as well as always on display. However, I think that this is not really a bad thing companies copying each other in most cases is a good thing, except when they remove features and in the Android world, we've copied a lot of stuff from Apple too. When Apple Maps replaced Google Maps, everything was chaotic, as it sucked. It was so bad that the Australian police recommended not using it, as it could cause accidents, and Cupertino's company had to apologize. Each iPhone release is controversial, but there are some that became very criticized, like AntennaGate, that referred to what happened if you held the iPhone 4 in your left hand, causing it to block the antennas and starting to lose signal. The iPhone 6 had BendGate, referring to the fact that it was also very prone to bending so hard that it could break. MacBooks also had a lot of issues, mainly before the M1 transition. They got really hot, causing them to throttle, and their butterfly keyboards stopped working quickly. In 2017, Apple started slowing down iPhones with updates. Of course, everyone got outraged. 
because they were clearly doing this on purpose to get you to buy another phone. According to the company, they were doing this to preserve the battery life of older phones, which would make sense, but the first reason also makes sense. I think that they added a setting in iOS that lets you toggle this behavior, but that's just as far as I know. One of the more recent controversies is the one caused after Apple stated that they would start scanning iCloud photos of their users to try to find illegal content by comparing the hashes. Obviously, this is a privacy invasive feature, so people complained on the internet and Apple stopped it. The hashtag get the message controversy consists of demanding Apple to add MMS support to iMessage, as this creates a bad experience for Android users. Finally, the stage manager controversy refers to Apple wanting to release the feature on iPads with a lot of bugs and only available for the M1 iPads. Epic Games vs Apple It all started when Epic Games in 2020 had code inside of the iOS and Android versions of Fortnite that would allow users to directly buy V-Bucks with a discounted price, bypassing the payment methods of these platforms and thus avoiding paying Apple and Google the 30% cut of microtransactions. When Epic enabled this code and the option was visible to users, it took a couple of hours for these companies to remove Fortnite from their stores, as this practice violated the terms of service. Then, Epic Games sued Apple and Google for anti-competitive behavior. Judge Rogers concluded that Apple didn't have a monopoly, but rather was part of a duopoly along with Google, and decided that Epic Games must pay Apple $3.6 million. Fortnite won't be able to return to iOS and macOS until 2026, approximately. Siloading Android Apps the official way of installing an Android app is by downloading it from the Google Play Store. However, sometimes the app that you're looking for is not on the Play Store, as it could have been removed, doesn't follow the Play Store guidelines, or was never there to begin with. That is why some users opt for sideloading apps. The most popular and easiest method is by installing the APK file. There are several sites that can help us to get these APKs. Some are safe and legal like APK Pure and APK Mirror, others that I have not tried like Aptoido, but there are some sketchy ones that allegedly allow you to install paid apps for free, but as you can imagine some of them include viruses, so I do not recommend installing from these, and it is also piracy. Some sites also offer the app bundle version from a program. These are the new packaging format recently introduced and now enforced to the new Play Store uploads. APKs contain everything an app has, for example layouts for large screens or translations and exclusive content for some devices. This makes them a little bit bloated, as they include stuff that you don't really need. App bundles with the AAAB extension try to solve this by only including stuff that your device does need. So instead of including all translations and layouts, it only includes instructions in the form of a split APKs to build an optimized APK that only has your languages and your screen resolution, saving storage. However, this usually makes them a little bit more tedious to install because you need a specific app to handle a split APKs. There are some apps that really can't be installed easily and the only way to do so is by force installing it or even decompiling it. Foldable phones before smartphones, foldable dumb phones or flip phones were very common. Companies now started to look back and thought that bringing them back could offer some good advantages, like having a tablet-sized device fold in half to turn it into a normal-sized phone, or having a normal-sized phone turn into a very little thing that fits easily in your pocket. But how would you make a modern phone whose front screen is made entirely with glass fold? I mean, like Zach says, glass is glass and glass breaks. 
Well, foldable phones work with a plastic screen that even if it is way less resistant, it can fold in half. Samsung is one of the pioneers of this type of phones, with its Galaxy lineup and Flip series that have been the most successful devices of its kind. But we also have some other brands that have tried it too, like Motorola with its Razer, or my favorite implementation, the Oppo Find N, that is more of a square device which makes it more reachable when folded and has also a good tablet aspect ratio when unfolded. Some believe that these phones could be the future, but for now, it seems a little bit hard. It's new technology, so it's expensive and has a lot of room for improvement, but we'll see. Worst Windows Versions Windows 8 is the successor of Windows 7, and it is the third worst version of the OS, according to just uh, how popular it was. Microsoft thought it was a good idea to only focus on touch in a desktop operating system. They removed the stored menu along with its button and replaced it with a weird stored screen that introduced the Metro UI tiles. The thing was so confusing that most people had to search how to shut down their computers, think that improved with the 8.1 version, but not enough for it to be considered a good operating system. The second worst version is Windows Vista, again according to popularity, that featured the error design also seen in the next OS iteration. The error style, in my opinion, has aged like milk. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the inclusion of it back then in 2007 made computers have a lot of performance issues. It also had a bad implementation of the user account control as you often saw the dialog asking for permission to do anything, and most of the drivers did not work properly. But the award for the worst version goes to Windows Millennium Edition or just Windows ME or ME. It was released back in the year 2000, being targeted to home computers, and it was some mess mostly because of bugs that made it unstable and a pain to use. The Redmond's company had to release Windows XP to fix everything they did wrong with the Millennium Edition. Because there is usually a pattern of a good and then a bad version of Windows, people think, and well for other reasons, that Windows 11 is the bad version. <laughs> Android News Websites there are news websites dedicated specifically to Android, for example, 9to5Google, Android Authority, Android Police, Android Central, and the first Android dedicated news website, Fandroid. Samsung Sam in mid-2021, these unofficial renders made by Lightform of a girl promoting Samsung products called Samantha went viral. The internet was attracted by her and a lot of fan art as well as misinformation started to appear, thinking that she was going to eventually replace Samsung's official virtual assistant, Bixby, but no. The truth is that these are not official renders, they are only concepts of how a virtual assistant could look like in human form. I really do wonder why Samsung didn't follow the trend and make her an official character or something, it would have been just good marketing. Your phone may not be on the latest version. It is likely that your phone hasn't gotten the latest version Android 13, that is, if it is going to get it at all. Fragmentation in Android is very bad, but it is not the only reason why Android sucks when it comes to updates. As we've seen before, OEMs usually apply their own skin on top of stock Android. This is one of the reasons why it usually takes so long to get an update, because they don't ship Android as is, they have to make sure it looks and behaves how they want, and also so they have to get rid of all the bugs and make their newer devices compatible. Sometimes the update has to go through AOSP, then your OEM, next your carrier, and finally it arrives to your device, usually 6 months later. But if your phone is a low-end device, you can expect less and slower updates. OEMs don't really get anything from updating phones for several years, they'd rather make your phone lose support and force you to buy another one. The phones that have the best updates 
support are the Google Pixel phones, but chances are that you don't have any of these as they don't sell them worldwide. This is why there is always a one year gap between your version and the actual latest version of the OS. So that counter shows us that most people are still running Android 11. This is a striking contrast with iOS, with the majority of phones running the latest version. Well, the version that was the latest one when I was making the script. Control Panel the control panel is a program used for changing settings for the system in Windows. It was introduced over 30 years ago in 1985 with the release of Windows 1.0, so it is one of the oldest components of the Microsoft's operating system. It currently has 8 sections, system and security, network and internet, hardware and sound, programs, user accounts, appearance and personalization, language and region, and ease of access. Access. Microsoft has been trying to get rid of the control panel by hiding it and recommends instead the settings app that has a cleaner and updated UI. The issue is that this app currently does not have more advanced features. Most of the old settings are still in the control panel. Voice Assistant a voice assistant is a program that usually uses AI to reply to what you say, giving you information related to what you asked or accepting commands. The best one, in my opinion, is the Google Assistant. Then you have Apple's Siri, Samsung's Bixby, Amazon's Alexa, and Cortana that I think it's dead. <laughs> Desktop Mode Desktop mode is a feature that some phones have that allows you to connect your phone with a USB-C to HDMI cable to a monitor. The UI will adapt itself to this bigger screen size and you will get features like floating windows or a taskbar. In the stock version of Android, we have a weird, very bare bones version of this mode introduced with Android 10. The thing was very hidden, but it shows you an app drawer and allows you to have multiple floating windows. To enable it, you have to go to the developer options and scroll down until you reach the app section, you have to enable freeform windows and force desktop mode. Still, I would recommend you to use a custom launcher that supports better this mode. The first phone to have a proper desktop mode was the Motorola Atrix that could connect to a lap dock that is basically a laptop without a processor powered by the phone itself. The most popular implementation of the desktop mode is definitely Samsung Dex. Built into One UI, even though it is exclusive to some phones, it is very complete, allowing you to have a stored menu, taskbar, and floating apps. Other brands have made their own implementations like Huawei's Easy Projection, Motorola's Ready for PC, Oxyrom's desktop mode, Xiaomi's MIUI Plus, and LG's implementation. If your OEM does not have this feature, you could try using Sentio Desktop, an app that tries to achieve the same thing. Navigation Methods A navigation method lets you control the three basic Android actions go back, go home, or see the overview menu with all your apps. Originally, there were more buttons on Android phones, but they became irrelevant and the three-button navigation remained, only switching from physical to capacitive and then digital buttons. With Android 9 Pie, Google introduced the two-button navigation that is an in-between the three-button navigation and the gesture navigation. You only have one button and if you tap it, you go home, if you swipe up, it shows you the overview, and if it's possible to go back, a back arrow will appear on the left. In the next OS update, the full gesture navigation was included, now allowing you to swipe up to go home, swipe up and hold to go to the overview, and swiping from the left or right edge to go back. Most people I've seen use the gesture navigation now, and I prefer it too, but there are some people that also prefer other navigation methods. Apple fails. Apple has had a couple of fails. We've already seen the Apple Maps one, but another well-known fail is the one that happened when Craig Federighi tried to unlock an iPhone 10 in a presentation. It didn't recognize his face and locked itself. <laughs> Apple replied to this, stating that it didn't misbehave, but that rather worked as expected, as people were trying to use it before the presentation, but it didn't recognize anyone's faces asking for the passcode. Face ID 
does not get reactivated unless you unlock the iPhone successfully, so that would make sense. A more recent fail was caused by the iPhone 14's new crash detection feature that calls emergency services when someone is riding a roller coaster because it thinks it's a core crash. To be fair, both situations are similar, a lot of movement, noise, and speed. Now another one that wasn't committed by Apple, but it is still related to one of its products, tells us the story of a Russian soldier who found an abandoned MacBook. He wanted it, so he stored it into his chest armor pocket, replacing the ballistic plate designed to stop bullets. You can guess how the story ends. <laughs> As it received a Darwin Award, an ironic award for those that quote, improved the jam pool by removing themselves from it. Apple Logo Evolution Apple has one of the most iconic logos of all time, but it wasn't always this way. A lot of people don't know that this was the first Apple logo, being completely different to the one we now know. Then, you have the classic rainbow colored logo, and then, just variations of the logo according to their respective eras. Inconsistencies a software inconsistency refers usually to a design that doesn't fit well according to how the current design of the OS looks or behaves. All OSs have them to an extent, it doesn't matter if it's Mac OS, Linux or Android, but it is not a secret that Windows is almost a synonym for inconsistency, as when you're looking for a setting, for example, the deeper you get, the older the UI looks. Most advanced programs like the control panel still have the Windows 7 UI, and some older ones even have bits of Windows 95. This issue always seems to get worse with every new version that features a redesign. As a perfectionist, this is one of the things that I hate the most about Windows. Microsoft saved Apple in the 90s. Regardless of the iconic rivalry between Apple and Microsoft, it is said that the latter actually saved Apple in the 90s from going bankrupt by investing $150 million on it. Part of the deal was that Microsoft would port Internet Explorer and Office to the Macs, a move that was very controversial. However, in an article by ZDNet, it is explained that the investment was actually a payment due to the result of a lawsuit and Microsoft's contributions happened because both companies would cross-license older existing and new patents for the next five years. This would be what brought Office and Internet Explorer to the Mac and QuickTime to Windows. Time in Apple Commercials if you look closely to the time that iPhones always have in commercials, you'll see that it is 0941, which was the time when the first iPhone was shown to the public. Apple Watches have a similar tradition, but they show 1009, which is one minute earlier than the standard for other watches. Nobody really knows why, but it is speculated that it is because Apple wanted to make the watch look different in commercials. like. If it was ahead of its competitors or something like that. Another theory is that it looks more symmetrical, but there is not an official reason. BSOD a BSOD or blue screen of death is a system error that occurs for different reasons and forces the system to crash and restart. It receives this name because when restarting, a blue screen shows up informing you about the crash. Since Windows 8, a sad emoticon face was added to the screen along with an error code so that you can search more about the reason why your system crashed. Android's cameras suck in third-party apps. If you've just Android and iOS, 
You might note that usually the camera quality in Android phones is worse than third party apps compared to the quality iPhones have. This is because there are a few amount of iPhones and apps like Instagram or Snapchat can optimize easier these cameras because they don't have a huge amount of combinations of sensors, lenses, and other specifications. Samsung has partnered with Snapchat and other developers to optimize the Galaxy S21's cameras better, and it seems like people are satisfied with the result. Google tried to fix this still present issue with the Camera X API, but we'll probably have to wait until all developers start using it until we can have better quality and third-party apps. John Appleseed this is a name placeholder for Apple demos, but according to TechRadar, there could be more context behind, as it is the pseudonym of Mike Markula, a key part of Apple's success, and also is a reference to the real-life John Appleseed, who introduced apple trees to Ohio and other states. Apple decided to not support Adobe Flash. A shocking Apple decision for many was to not support Adobe Flash on their mobile devices, as it was the most popular technology for web development. The reason they gave was that all Adobe products are proprietary, kind of ironic, but well, <laughs> Flash drained a lot of battery life and it wasn't optimized for touchscreens. It also was just getting pretty outdated. I think Apple was right, and not supporting Flash basically led to its death, now replaced by HTML5. Villains never use iPhones If you watch a lot of movies or series, then you probably have noticed the pattern. All the good guys use iPhones and the bad guys use Android ones. It is believed that Apple pays studios or just plain forces them to make this happen. And in most cases, this is true. Like, I remember this was a spoiler for me when watching Falcon and the Winter Soldier because Sharon used an Android phone, but I think that in the Hawkeye series, everyone used Pixels, so it's not always the case. Interactive Wallpapers Live Wallpapers is a feature introduced with Eclair that lets you have interactive wallpapers. Some are just videos but other react to your tabs, swipes, and gyroscope. MIUI has its own implementation with super wallpapers that are wallpapers usually of planets that zoom in and out when you unlock your phone. I think they are kind of a gimmick, I personally don't use them as you can really feel your phone getting slower and draining more battery, it could also be distracting. Windows Defender It is the antivirus included with the system. It was initially based on giant anti-spyware made by a company named Giant, same one that was acquired by Microsoft, releasing Microsoft anti-spyware on December 16th of 2004 for Windows 2000, XP, and Server 2003. Some people dislike this software and try to disable it. I guess that it is to improve performance or just to install another antivirus software. In my opinion, this is the best antivirus for Windows as it is built into the system and is totally free. Windows Phone Windows Mobile was Microsoft's first mobile operating system. It came out in 2000 and it was based on Windows CE, optimized mainly for chunky, ugly mobile devices that required styluses. Remember that the iPhone was not a thing yet. Windows Phone is Windows Mobile's successor and it came out in 2010. Its purpose was to compete with iOS and Android, featuring a Metro UI with live tiles. It had multiple versions. Versions, Windows Phone 7, Windows Phone 8, and Windows Phone 8.1, but it ended up being discontinued in 2017 due to a lack of users. Tier 3 Developer Options 
the developer options are a series of hidden settings that allow you to access to more advanced features that usually would be useful to a developer, but sometimes they can also be useful to normal users. To enable them, you have to go to the settings app, scroll to the bottom, tap on about device, scroll to the bottom again and tap 7 times on the build number. Now you've unlocked the developer settings. Go back, tap on system, developer options. I will only mention the ones that I think are the most useful ones for normal users, power users and developers. The first one is under debugging and it is USB debugging to use ADB and debugging mode for an app. In that same section, we have show refresh rate. If you're not sure if your phone has high refresh enabled by default, you can choose to enable MAC address randomization if you want to avoid getting tracked with your MAC address. Under networking, you can choose the default USB configuration that you want to use when you connect your phone to a computer. This is useful to set transferring files as default behavior to not have to select it every time. Under drawing, you can select the speed for different animations. In hardware accelerated rendering, you can toggle override force dark to force apps with a light theme to have a dark one. Finally, if you want the desktop mode we showed you earlier, you can toggle it under apps. You can always disable and re-enable the developer options. Command prompt. Also known as CMD, it is the main command line program. It is used to execute different commands like copying and pasting files or running programs that do not use a graphical interface. It resembles MS-DOS, the old operating system that Windows was based from. Some other alternatives have appeared over the years like PowerShell, but the most recent one is the Windows Terminal that has a fluent design and tabs. To be honest, now that I've learned a little bit more about Linux and Unix and that stuff, you can notice how much worse are the command prompts and terminals of Windows compared to Bash. And no, opening a command prompt or terminal does not necessarily mean that you're about to hack someone. System32 Located at C backslash Windows backslash System32, this is an important folder that contains essential files required for the system to run properly. It is, or was, a very frequent joke on the internet to tell people to delete this folder, with the excuse of it being a virus or some heavy junk folder that worsens your performance. Of course, this is not true, and most people these days do not believe this so easily. Android Fonts Droid Sans is the first font made for Android. It was created in 2007 by Ascender Corporation and it is licensed under the Apache license. Its main goal is to stay clear on screens of small phones. There are three variations, Droid Serif, Droid Sans, and Droid Sans Mono. In 2011, with the release of Ice Cream Sandwich, a new default font for the system was created called Roboto. This one is also licensed under the Apache license. In Lollipop, Roboto got redesigned, changing some little details like replacing the punctuation marks on letters from squared to rounded. There are a couple of variations for this font like Roboto Slap and Roboto Mono. There are some Android skins that allow you to change your default system font, but for the ones that don't, you usually have to root your phone to be able to do so. Icon Packs In the Play Store, you can find icon packs that replace your stock icons with the ones that you like the most. Some are free and some are paid, but recently Google introduced themed icons for third-party apps. That is a standardized way of having simple icons that follow your theme. To use a custom icon pack, you usually have to have a custom launcher. Launchers a launcher is a program that takes care of your home screen's design and features. You can install different launchers and switch between them if you're not satisfied with your stock launcher. Most launchers are based on AOSP's Launcher 2 or 3. There are open source bare bones launchers that can be modified to make a more complete version. This is the case of Novo Launcher, known for being the most customizable launcher available. You can modify everything from the grid of your home screen 
to the badges on your app icons. It offers a limited free version, but buying the full version is almost a must for people that love to customize every aspect of their phone. If you prefer a more vanilla launcher with a nice few additional features, you have Launcher that is currently in its Android 12 beta, but should bring some really cool features like themed icons for all apps, even if you don't have Android 13. Another popular launcher is the Microsoft Launcher that has its own design including its own feed that lets you check a summarized version of your upcoming events and screen time as well as your news and your timeline. Then we have the Smart Launcher that automatically organizes your apps and categories allows you to have gridless widgets and customize it however you want. Finally, the AIO launcher tries to show you only a single home screen with a lot of important info like your frequent apps, timers, and a system monitor. I would probably use Launcher, but I hate the fact that gesture navigation support for third-party launchers is still very hit or miss. It used to work when I had my Motorola phone, but with my Redmi Note 10 Pro, it gives me a very annoying warning when I try to enable it. Material Design Material design is a series of guidelines and UI APIs Google provides, expecting apps to implement them and follow Android's current design and human interface guidelines. The first version was introduced with Android 5's Lollipop, and some components have been added over time, like the bottom app bar. But the biggest redesign to it came with Android 12, and it is called Material Design 3 or Material U. The main feature is that all the components adapt themselves to your device accent color that is taken from your wallpaper, and also they improved support for large devices. I really like it, but let's be real, most phone brands and apps value more their own aesthetic, so most of them won't implement it at all. Jailbreak this is a process that lets you install third-party apps and have other features, but at the cost of less security and no warranty. It comes from the metaphor of iOS being so locked down that it is compared to a jail, and by performing the process, you break free from the limitations of the jail. There is a big debate of whether doing this is legal or not, but it varies depending the country. The first time this was done was back in 2007, just a couple of days after the original iPhone's release, achieving to add custom ringtones, wallpapers, and more. Apple has made it harder to jailbreak a device, being now only possible on older versions of iOS, but as I have said, the modern community always finds a way. U2 Removal Tool I remember this one. It was kind of hilarious to me. Well, it turns out that the Irish rock band U2 partnered with Apple, releasing their album Songs of Innocence for free, but in the most annoying way possible, as it wasn't just listed as free on iTunes, but rather, the album was automatically added to all accounts without asking for permission, causing a lot of people to be confused and bothered by this. I was one of them, but I have to admit that I did end up listening to some seconds of some songs by mistake. People were so annoyed by this and by the fact that it couldn't be removed easily that Apple had to release a U2 removal tool <laughs> that would get rid of the album, but you wouldn't be able to re-download it again for free. I didn't know about this, so probably my iTunes account still has that album. Apple Leaks Every year iPhones get leaked, and not only iPhones but also a lot of other Apple products like iPads and Macs. Even when Tim Cook tries really hard to get rid of the leaks, they always come up, and with a very good accuracy, leaking almost everything. At least in the software side, I haven't seen many Apple leaks recently, so they probably improved that. A very iconic leak happened when an Apple employee forgot an iPhone 4 prototype, 
and it somehow got to the hands of a Gizmodo editor who took pictures of the device and published an exclusive article about it. Police raided his house and took the prototype. Some rumored Apple products are the self-driving Apple car, a foldable MacBook and iPad, and a mixed reality headset. Discrimination against Android users it is somewhat known that because iPhones are very expensive and Androids are usually cheaper, there are some Apple users that have some sort of elitism and they pick another phone's users. This is obviously not the case for all people that use the iPhone, it is just the vocal minority. Times of India published an article where based on a 1,500 people survey made by the company Declutter, they came up with the conclusion that most people would prefer to date an iPhone user over an Android user. Malta Daily did a similar thing but based on a British dating app called Palm where 3000 people selected that something that would turn them off would be a person using an Android device. A very known controversy that for some of us feels like a first world problem is the green versus blue bubbles thing. If you didn't know, most people in the US use iPhones and for messaging they use the default iMessage app that comes with it. Messages between iPhones and Apple devices are represented with a blue bubble. These ones have exclusive proprietary features that Apple has included and they're better overall. Android users messages are represented with a green bubble. That means that that message uses MMS, which is an old technology that does not have read receipts, encryption, high-risk media sharing, and a lot of other features that we expect from a modern messaging app. RCS has all of these things and it's a standard that could improve compatibility between iPhones and Android's messages only if Apple decided to support it. But if they did, all messages would have the same features regardless of what phone you use, making it easier for other people to switch to an Android phone. Google has tried to make Apple to do something to fix it, but hasn't achieved anything. And now, basically when everyone sees a green bubble, they know that person is using Android, and it's common for childish people people to pick on other ones that do not have iPhones. Taskbar Starting with Android 12L, a new taskbar was introduced for large screen devices that fuses together your favorite apps and the system navigation. It allows you to directly launch an app quickly or drag it to a side to open it and split screen. With this year's update, a shortcut for the app drawer was also added to the taskbar, basically making it a start menu. If you don't have these updates or a tablet, in the Google Play Store there is an open source app called Taskbar that lets you replicate some of this functionality and is compatible with the hidden AOS piece desktop mode. Samsung makes Apple's displays. Yes, just in case that you didn't know. It's a good decision in my opinion as Samsung makes good panels, but also for the iPhones, Apple doesn't manufacture their 5G modems, which are made by Qualcomm. Android malware. The most popular OS is definitely going to be the main target for several malware, as it is our most personal device. There are different types of viruses like AdWord that shows you intrusive ads in certain parts of the system to make money, spyware that spies on your personal information like contacts, photos, and even bank accounts, and trojans that are quiet viruses that hide themselves very well and do some very suspicious activity in the background. One of these trojans was Dendroid discovered first in 2014. It was capable of deleting call logs, opening web pages, dialing numbers, recording calls, opening apps, and performing denial of service attacks. The code leaked, and that's how we know that it had a way of binding the Android to legitimate apps. But sometimes, you don't have to download something to be vulnerable. This was the case of the Dirty Cow Vulnerability, that stands for Dirty Copy on Write, and affected all Linux systems. And as we know, that includes Android devices with kernel versions created before 2018. It allowed the escalation of privileges, and having superuser permissions means that they can basically do whatever they want with your system, like installing a keylogger or running malicious code. One of the most popular spyware 
software programs is Pegasus, developed by the Israeli Cyber Arms Company NSO Group. It can be installed on the two main mobile OSs and it is capable of reading text messages, tracking calls, collecting passwords, and performs location tracking. I would recommend you to always keep your phone up to date as security patches fix vulnerabilities that can be exploited to harm or steal information from your device. We constantly get news about apps from the official Play Store that were infected with malware, bypassing Google's inspections and the Play Store Protect feature, so be careful when choosing what apps to install. Unfortunately, Google has made it harder to know if an app is potential malware by replacing the permissions section with the data safety section. But I'd say that if you only download very popular apps and open source apps, you could be safe. Still, only grant the necessary permissions missions. Android File System Android has a similar file system to Linux. It all starts with the root directory. Under it, we have the read-only slash system partition that has system files for stuff like the GUI, pre-installed apps, and it is basically the ROM of your phone. This partition gets overwritten whenever you get an update, but only if it is cryptographically signed by your OEM unless you unlock your bootloader. The slash boot partition has the bootloader and the kernel. Without it, your phone won't boot. Slash recovery is where your stock or custom recovery is installed. You can overwrite this partition with another one by installing a custom recovery like TWRP or twerp. Slash data is where you can find your internal and external storage. Internal storage means the data that apps create and that is intended to only be accessed by the app that created it, not by the user unless they root. For example, think of your progress files from an offline game. External storage Storage, however, refers to the part of the file system that the user is intended to use for storing and modifying their files. Storing directories like documents, downloads, music, DZIM, where you will find your taken photos, Android, where your apps store their public data, and pictures. This location is known as slash storage slash emulated slash zero or slash SD card. That is a link to the first one mentioned. The zero in the path is some sort of ID for the default user user, but if you created more users, I will change according to them, having another number instead. Under slash data as external storage, you can also find your external removable storage, like an SD card or a USB. That is, if you choose to use it in portable mode, that behaves like its own entity, similar to how it works when you use external storage on a computer. If you decide to use the adaptable mode instead, it will fuse the removable SD card with your internal storage meaning that you will only get more storage and it will be seen as one entity. But if you remove the removable device, apps will start to fail and files will go missing. When you format your phone, the only thing that gets wiped is the data partition. Slash cache is where important and frequently accessed data will be. And in slash misc is where other stuff is stored, like the carrier or region ID. Windows 9 after Windows 8, the obvious successor was going to be Windows 9, but Microsoft decided to skip this number and go directly with the 10 instead. The reason is that the company wanted to make people forget about the 8th version. It is a psychological thing to make you think that it is very different from its predecessor. If they had named it with the 9, you would think that it is a direct continuation of the 8. A lot of people also mentioned in the original Ice something that I forgot to include, and that is that another more technical reason could be that when apps try to look for your Windows version, if the number starts with 9, they would think that you're running Windows 95 or 98, even though some people consider Windows 8.1 to be the actual Windows 9. Why the I? The first device to use the i prefix was the iMac. Originally, it was going to be called the MacMan, but according to Ars Technica, the idea came from Ken Siegel, who proposed the name. Jobs initially didn't like it, but then he liked it enough for it to become the final name. The i stands for internet, but also for individuality and innovation. This was later adopted for other products phones with infrared. 
There are phones that include infrared sensors, most Xiaomi phones still do. This can be useful to control your smart devices or your TV, but to be honest, I've never used it even when my phone has it. Extremely cheap Android phones because Android is free to use, anyone can make a very cheap phone running it. You can find some on Amazon, mainly from brands like Blue or Alcatel. Some of these even cost $30. However, there are always cheap clones of phones, usually on Wish.com, like the ones you're seeing right now made to fool people into thinking they're buying a flagship using very similar names, but you'll notice it's fake when you start seeing the specs. Apple hoaxes. When iOS 7 was released, fake ads promoting a new waterproofing feature appeared, fooling a lot of people. <laughs> but they raised the stakes by adding another fake ad, saying that thanks to AirDrop, you could drop your phone, the sensor would detect it and switch important components off, as well as vibrating the phone enough for it to land face up, protecting the screen. <laughs> when iOS 8 released, they repeated the formula and stated that if you microwaved your phone, it would absorb the energy and get charged. Of course, don't try any of these, they are all fake, and the last one can even be dangerous as your phone will explode. Samsung Eye Toast by visiting trigalaxy.com, you will be able to test a demo of how the UI of a Samsung phone works, making it easier for people interested to switch to a Samsung phone. A pretty clever strategy. Rooting in Unix-like systems such as Android, there is a user called the super user or just root user in reference to the fact that it is the only user that can affect the root file system. It has absolutely all permissions to do everything that is possible from creating a normal file to deleting the entire system with a file explorer that lets you use these privileges, like material files. This is why, as a security measure, but also to lock down Android to an extent, the root user is disabled by default, and you cannot enable it unless you unlock your bootloader, which forces you to factory reset as well as rooting does, and you will lose your warranty. Programs like Majisk or SuperSU allow you to enable this root user and grant its permissions to apps, usually by patching the boot image. Some other programs like Kingo or King Root allegedly allow you to root your phone with just one click without having to unlock the bootloader nor using a computer. They seem very suspicious to me, but maybe they did actually work in the past. I just wasn't using Android back then to confirm it. So please let me know in the comments. There are a couple of reasons why you would want to root your phone, like removing bloatware, customizing your phone's UI, or removing ads. There are also so-called unrootable phones or phones that are very hard to root, mainly because they don't allow bootloader unlocking. On the opposite side though, there have been reports of phones that actually have access to ADB root because the OEM forgot to disable it. However, keep in mind that when rooting, some apps, especially banking apps, will detect it and won't allow you to use them unless you use a Majestic module to hide it. Weird phones there have been multiple weird and interesting Android phones, for example the LG Wing. That was a phone that had two screens and the one on top could rotate forming a T-shape. This would be useful to play a video and have the screen on the bottom as a media controller or to have a better gaming experience on devices that supported it. Samsung made its own weird phones like the Galaxy Beam that had a projector or the Galaxy Round that was, well, curved to be more comfortable to use, I guess. LG also made its own curved phone called the LG G Flex, but the cool thing about it was that it was also able to heal its own rear cover from minor scratches. The Jota phone was a phone with an e-ink display on the back, which could be compared to what we know now as an always-on display, but a little bit more advanced because you could interact with it. Asus made the Pad phone that was a phone that could be inserted into a tablet and the phone would power it. The Cubex Q phone has an interesting feature. It allows you to see 3D content without glasses as well as taking 3D photos and videos. It does cost $700 though. ADB
The Android Debug Bridge is a command line tool that allows your phone to connect to a computer with a cable or wirelessly if you have a phone that runs Android 11 or above, and perform different commands with the purpose of debugging an app or modding your phone. To use such, you have to have a Windows, Mac, or Linux computer and download the SDK platform tools from the official website. Then enable USB debugging under Developer Options and the Settings app. Next, connect your phone with a cable to your PC and finally open a terminal in the location where you have the SDK tools. I'm going to mention the most common commands. We begin with ADB devices that is usually the first command that you'll run to see what devices are connected and if the connection is working. ADB pull allows you to get a file from your phone to your PC and ADB push does the opposite, uploading a file from your PC to your phone. First, you always type ADB if you have multiple devices. You you type dash s in the name of the device then the command the path that we're getting that file from and the path that we want to upload that file to in our pc if it says that one file was pulled we executed the command successfully now let's try with adb push the syntax is very similar but the parameters will be reversed so after push you type the path to your file from your PC, and then where you want to send it to in your phone. You should see a message telling you that the file was pushed. Now the next command is adb show that lets us control our phone via a terminal. So if you already know a little bit about bash, this will be familiar to you. We'll control our phone to see the file that we exported to it from our computer. The first part of the syntax is the same, just type adb and select your device. Then shell. If this operation was successful, you are going to see the name of your phone and a dollar sign, indicating that we are a normal user. Use the command cd standing for change directory and as an argument, type the path where your file is located at. Execute the command ls, that means list, to see the files in that directory, and you should see our exported file. To exit the shell mode, type exit. Now we're going to execute the command adb logcat that lets us see all the logs that app sent to us. This is mainly useful to see if some line of code from your app that run. To cancel keep seeing the logcat, press ctrl and c. Finally, to reboot your device, just run adb reboot. ADB has had a couple of easter eggs, for example if you run ADB hell instead of ADB shell, you would get a red and yellow terminal text and highlight colors but the command would work the same way. Seems like this has been removed though. You can execute ADB lolcat instead of ADB lockcat and it will still work. Typing ADB longcat will show you the logs but in a different format. The first Android phone. The first commercial Android phone was the HTC Dream, also known as the T-Mobile G1 in the US and some parts of Europe. When Google acquired Android Inc. back in 2005 to compete against Symbian and Windows Mobile, it led to the creation of a prototype of the HTC Dream, codenamed as the Sooner. It was a phone similar to BlackBerry with small, non-touch screen, navigation keys, and physical keyboard. When Apple announced the iPhone, they had to switch their focus, creating the device that we currently know. Android also adapted to this new vision being officially unveiled in November of 2007. When it released, the reception was mixed as everyone was comparing it to the original iPhone and it couldn't compete as well in some aspects, like media consumption, as Apple integrated its iPhone with iTunes, but in general, people were excited to see how Android improved as it promised a new open ecosystem contrasting to Apple's iPhone OS. AOSP AOSP stands for Android Open Source Project and it is the base of all Android systems. You can get the open source code from the official website and it is licensed under the Apache 2 license, so you can make closed source forks of it. If you use it, it will be a hard experience keeping in mind that it is really not optimized for your phone, so if you have a notch, it won't support it properly, it doesn't have play services or even a browser that allows you to download stuff, so the whole experience could be this 
described as raw. You are seeing how it looks right now and you might have already noticed that there are some very ancient apps here as Google doesn't care about the AOSP apps because they have replaced them with their proprietary versions but that is an interesting topic that deserves its own video that I'm already working on. Android Forks Android is technically open source, but Google manages to make life living hell for those that try to make an Android fork. And with that term, I'm referring to modifications to Android that go beyond being a commercial Google Play Services compliant skin that adds UI tweaks and a few features. Custom ROMs have their own entry, so we'll talk about them later. I'm referring to OSs that have tried to create their own ecosystems ditching Googles, with the only thing in common being that they're based on Android. First, we have Amazon's Fire OS that as you know does not have GMLs. So they had to build their own Amazon services. Instead of Google Maps, you have Amazon Maps. Replacing Firebase Cloud Messaging, you have Amazon Device Messaging. Google Play in-app billing is replaced with Amazon in-app purchasing API and so on. The different launcher is the first thing you notice with tabs for different programs but also your media library, promoting services like Prime Video, Amazon Music, and Amazon Shopping. This OS is only available for Fire tablets, only sold by Amazon, and for Fire TV boxes, but it's one of the two most popular forks of Android. The second popular and commercial fork is Harmony OS. After being banned from selling products and collaborating with companies in the US, Huawei had to develop its own OS. Of course, because AOSP can be used by anyone by passing the US ban, the Chinese company took it as its base with the only issue being that it didn't have GMS. Not a big issue in China as they don't use them there anyway, but it was truly one for the rest of the world. So they developed Huawei mobile services that include the app gallery, pedal maps and search, mobile cloud, the Huawei ID, music and themes. As the name implies, it tries to harmonically connect your smart devices. It was shipped at first in Honor smart TVs, but later it arrived to smartphones, tablets and smart watches. And smartphones and tablets, it looks very, very similar to iOS. These two previously mentioned brands have had moderate success with their forks, but the next one we'll talk about is not trying to be commercial at all. In fact, its goal is to remain 100% open source, licensed under the GPL and sponsored by the FSF itself. Replicant OS is an Android fork that tries to remove all proprietary bits from the AOSP code. Its latest release is based on Lineage OS 13 that builds upon Android 6, so it looks dated, but it is not trying to appeal to everyone. The project is still alive and well, and looks like the next release will be Replicant OS 10, based on Lineage OS 17 that uses Android 10 as its base. If your phone is compatible with Lineage OS, chances are that it is also compatible with Replicant. Tier 4 Win32 this refers to an API made a long time ago that helps you to develop applications that can run on all versions of Windows while being able to use features of the system unique to each version. Most Windows programs are made using this technology that it is now called the Windows API. To give an example of a program built with Win32, you have the control panel or the Windows Media Player. Microsoft Bimbos This was a used computer reaper store in Japan. Someone took a picture of the place and it became a meme, as it was a clear parody of Microsoft Windows. The name actually has more context, as it is a pun with the Japanese word bimbo, that means cheap. This is how it looks nowadays, though. OS Traders Sometimes people endorse using an operating system, but then turns out that they don't even use that OS themselves. <laughs> an example of this is when this photo became popular that shows an Apple factory, but there's something wrong. 
the iMac there is running Windows. <laughs> this would make sense as some software used to control these machines is only available for Microsoft's OS. Ironically, the Linux Foundation has been caught using Macs and to make the reports they use Adobe software which is proprietary and goes against what the foundation should stand for. This is why a lot of people don't like this organization and prefer authors like the FSF. Finally, there have been some celebrities that promote Android phones, but Twitter states that the post was made from an iPhone. UWP UWP stands for Universal Windows Platform and it is the successor of the Windows API. Well, kind of was because it was deprecated. <laughs> It was designed for making apps that can be compatible with Windows 10 and higher devices. UWP features Flint Design and most apps built with it. It has not really been that popular and this, the settings app and Groove Music are examples of how a UWP program looks like. Goo Phone this is a company that creates iPhone clones, copying the hardware and the software. According to Amazon, the Goo Phone 13 Pro Max runs Android 10, has a 6.7 inches display, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and 512 gigabytes of storage, powered by a Dimensity 810. I really doubt the memory specs, but well. <laughs> Windows Sandbox this is an application that creates a temporary virtual machine, useful for executing files that you are not sure if they are safe. A lot of people don't know this program because it's hidden as it is available just for Windows Pro, so the home editions will not have it, and even if you have a Pro edition, you have to activate some things to get it to work. To enable the sandbox, do the following steps. First, check if you have virtualization enabled, you can see that with the task manager's performance tab. If you do not have it enabled, reboot your computer to access the BIOS or UFI and turn on virtualization. Depending on your hardware, it could have a different name. Turn your computer on and open turn Windows features on or off. Check the boxes for Hyper-V and Windows Sandbox. Reboot your computer and now you can access the Sandbox. XDA Developers XDA Developers is a tech news website, but they also have forums. These ones are where you should go if you're into Android modding, as the community knows a lot about it and is usually willing to help and answer your questions. Also, in your phone's dedicated sub-forum, you can find ROMs, recoveries, and more. Run Android on non-Android devices Android apps or the OS itself can run on other devices that originally didn't run it. Let's begin with the ways to run these apps on your desktop. Chrome OS by default has been able to run Android apps without much trouble and with functioning Play services for quite some time now. You have to download them from the Play Store. However, if you use Windows, you can try using Windows 11's Windows subsystem for Android. For now, it is limited to only some countries and you're limited to Amazon apps, but you always have the option to sideload APKs. Of course, this approach does not have GMS, even though it's possible to install them jumping through some hoops. If not having Google Play services is a deal breaker for you, then you could try BlueStacks, it is an emulator that includes them and is mainly focused on playing Android games on your Windows machine, so it's probably the most reliable option. If you use Linux, you have a couple of options, for example, Mbox, which is not an emulator but a container, making it faster and integrating it well with your applications. To install it, you have to get the snap package. There is another alternative called Wayjoid that is also a container, a Lineage OS 1 to be exact, but seems to be an improved version of Aimbox. It does require you to be using Wayland on your system though, so if you don't have it, it won't work, and it seems to be a little harder to set up. I have to mention that none of these options for Linux include GMS, but it is possible to sideload them. Because they are compatible with the Linux system, that means the Linux phones like the Pine phone can run Android apps too, and that is one of the things that Linux phone enthusiasts hope will improve, so people can switch to them easier. 
What about running Android apps on iOS? Well, if you have a fake iPhone, you are most likely already able to run them, as some of these run a heavily customized version of Google's OS. One time, a couple of sellers tried to persuade me to buy them a fake golden iPhone 10 that was obviously running Android, but that is an anecdote that I will tell you in another video if you want. Now, seriously, people have managed to make Android run on iOS with Project Sandcastle that uses the Linux kernel and modifies it as well as other elements to be able to run Bugdroid's OS. OpenAI Boot achieves the same thing but with a different approach, making an open source implementation of Apple's closed source bootloader iBoot. This allows you to boot unsigned code like Android on iPhones. You also have ACL for Tizen that supposedly lets you run Android apps on Tizen, but I have never seen it actually working and download sites seem suspicious. For Windows Phone, Microsoft was actually developing a way of being able to run Android apps called Project Astoria, but it was cancelled, so there is not an official way of doing this for this platform. Unknown Apple Products There are a ton of unknown Apple products, probably the one that you have heard of is the Apple Newton, which tried to be like an iPod but decades before the tech was there, so it was expensive and the handwriting recognition wasn't the best. Before the iPhone, there was the iTunes phone, aka the Rocker. It had a 0.3 megapixel camera and stored music on a micro SD card, but had a 100 songs limit and the following version of iTunes removed support for this phone. Similar to the previously mentioned device, this next one was born when Apple partnered with HP to make HP iPods. This happened because Apple needed more retail channels than they had and HP could sell them as if they were their own products. Another one is the iPod socks that protect your iPod from damage, the laser grinder, Apple's printer, the pip pen, Apple's console, quick take, a camera, the Macintosh TV that can Combine the mentioned products and Apple's clothing line. Windows Safe Mode This is a feature that starts the system in a basic state, just with certain files and drivers. It is used mainly to know if some program or driver is causing a problem on your system, so most times you will not have to use it. To boot the OS in this mode, open the settings app, then go to update and security, then under advanced startup, select restore now. When your PC restarts, you will see a screen with multiple options. Click on trouble Shoot, advanced options, startup settings, and restart. After restarting, press 4 to start your computer in safe mode, or 5 to start it in safe mode but with internet connection. Classic Windows Games most likely, this video will make you remember them. Games like Solitaire, Black Hole Pinball, Minesweeper, and the godlike Purple Plays. Classic Windows games have been shipped since Windows 1.x, adding more with each version until all of them were removed with the release of Windows 8. Currently, you can find only the Solitaire collection from Microsoft Store, but it is a modern version of the games, and it also sucks a lot that they added ads. Some people wonder what was their purpose, and surprisingly, it was not to only entertain the user, but also to teach beginners how to use the mouse, as that was a new thing back then. To be honest, I never learned to play Solitaire nor Minesweeper, but I do remember having a great time playing Purple Plays. Windows Blotware since 10, Microsoft has been adding a lot of blotware to everyone's computers. You only have to open the stored menu to see a lot of apps you didn't ask for, from stock UWP programs like Mail and Photos to some weird stuff like Candy Crush, TikTok, Clipchamp, and well. Sometimes it can be worse because your OEM adds stuff like the McAfee antivirus. You can delete most of these things, but not all of them can be removed easily, hence why the community has made some scripts to get rid of all the blotware, but to be honest, I haven't used any, so if you plan on using one, do it at your own risk. Breaking. 
If you flash a custom ROM, root, or do any modification to your phone improperly, you can get a series of errors. None of these are nice to see and they can make you very worried. The least alarming error that you can get is a boot stuck or boot loop. This makes your phone boot but never go past a certain point, usually the boot animation. In other cases, it keeps rebooting but never boots to the system. It's normal for your phone to take a couple of minutes to boot the first time you install a new custom ROM, so I would only worry if you see that it's taking more than 10 minutes. This is also known as soft breaking, meaning that your phone is useless because it doesn't have a system, but can be fixed by flashing another one from the recovery. However, the one that I hope that you never experience is a hard break, where usually some core components like the kernel or the boot partition got damaged, not even allowing you to boot into fast boot or the recovery, making it, well, as useful as a brick, and can't be recovered from that state. Android users vulnerable to error text gang. Apple recently started selling a new product called the AirTag. Its purpose is to track objects that could easily get lost or robbed. It is different from your usual tracker because every Apple device contributes to a network that reports the last location of your AirTags, making it very effective in a country like the US where most people use iPhones. People with bad intentions knew that they could probably use these tags to track people down, but iPhones will show you an alert if they detect that a nerd tag has been near for too long. This is not the case with Android phones. Yes, Apple did release an app for Android that does the same thing, but the main issue is that this app does not work in the background, so you have to manually look for them, making people without iPhones more vulnerable to this risk. Bootcamp Bootcamp is the macOS utility that lets you dual boot macOS and Windows. Unfortunately, it only works for Intel-based Macs, as Windows for ARM kinda sucks and Apple never really provided support for it. Bootcamp doesn't install Linux distros, but people have been able to dual boot Linux on Apple Silicon Macs with a special distribution called Asahi Linux. It is pretty impressive what the open source community can achieve even without any documentation. I think recently GPU acceleration support was added, opening a lot of possibilities like probably gaming, even though keep in mind that it is still in development. But at least for Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, it is good enough for him, making him switch to an Apple Silicon Mac, installing this distro on it and compiling one of the latest versions of the Linux kernel from it. Regidot. The registry editor, aka Regidot, it's an executable file that you can use for creating and editing the registry keys and values. Some people use it to modify visual or technical aspects of the system, disable features that they dislike, or to improve performance a little. This is a striking contrast with how Unix handles configurations as they just used plain editable text files. I would not recommend you to change anything unless you know what you're doing because you can break something. Windows NT Windows used to be actually a program running on top of MS-DOS, an operating system that did not have a graphical interface. That is why Microsoft decided to make Windows an operating system by itself, creating Windows NT that stands for New Technology. NT is actually the kernel. It was focused at first mainly for enterprises, but it ended up being merged with the standard home versions starting with Windows XP. Currently, the last versions of the OS are still based on NT, and most likely they will remain that way. Chrome OS Chrome OS is a proprietary operating system that uses the Linux kernel, and it is focused on being simple, easy to use, and lightweight. It achieves the last thing mentioned because basically, Chrome OS is just Chrome on top of the gentle Linux distro and the apps are just progressive web apps. Over time, this OS has gotten more complete, with the ability to run Android apps with Google Play services very well, and even Linux apps. 
making it a rather interesting option for beginners or for people with a low-end computer. Similar to Android, this project is based on a more bare-bones, open-source version of it called Chromium OS. Chrome OS is exclusive for Chromebooks, but recently a new version came out called Chrome OS Flux that makes you able to install it on any supported computer. I was actually making a video about the installation and everything, and it got cancelled because it was such a pain to get it to work, starting with the flashing tool that Google provides that always fails and won't work on Linux, and the OS is still in very early stages, rebooting every 5 minutes. Windows 11 Ice Cream some of you might not know this, but to celebrate the release of Windows 11, Microsoft released a special edition ice cream with the default wallpaper, and the flavor was called Bloomberry. Apple Malware I'm going to make a standalone video about this because it's pretty interesting. You never really hear about viruses for eye devices. Probably you already know about the spyware Pegasus, so I'm going to skip that one. You've definitely encountered this one. A fake pop-up claiming that you have malware and asking you to take action to remove it. And once you do, the actual virus starts to work or it redirects you to download some sketchy app to get rid of it. To me, it's very obvious that these are fake, as even when they tried to replicate the pop-up very closely, they missed some details like the icons not being aligned properly, and Apple usually doesn't type everything in uppercase. <laughs> There are some variations where an actual system pop-up is displayed through an alert requested by the website. These tend to be displayed in websites with tons of ads. Like when you try to download a file or a mod, but it's hosted by Adfly. Another similar one tells you to enable notifications or sync your calendar app with one filled with ads to be able to download the file and keep sending you spam without the need of actually downloading or running any application. As technically, this permission is working as expected. To get rid of these, you can disable notifications or remove the calendar and prevent this from happening on iOS by using an app blocker. Another type of very smart malware is the one where someone sends you a character, and for different reasons, like overloading the memory while trying to decode it, it causes your phone to reboot, and in some instances, it gets caught in a boot loop. So if you see that messages like these are getting popular, don't open them and update as fast as you can. Dragon Ball Z Naming Conflict In the anime Dragon Ball Z, there's this character called Android 13, which makes it very easy to get confused, not knowing if someone means Google's OS or the character. This is very evident when looking for pictures mainly, as both appear in the results. This is why some people thought that Google would change the name of the latest iteration of Android to avoid the naming conflict, but it didn't end up happening. Icons and emojis with Easter eggs Apple loves to hide Easter eggs. A good example of this is when they include ones in their icons, like the open book emoji on iOS, that when looking closely, you can notice it has a quote said by Steve Jobs, or the calendar icon in macOS shows the date when this app itself was announced. The funniest for me is this icon in macOS that represents Windows PCs showing a blue screen of Death, an accurate representation as I've had like three of these in this month. FaceTime intended to be an open standard. When this software was announced, it was intended to be an open standard, but it became too good and Apple decided to keep it as an iDevices exclusive feature. However, recently FaceTime now started to support Android and Windows to an extent. There is no app for these platforms, so you can only answer calls from the web browser. It's still a proprietary application and is half-baked for other platforms, so I would not call it an open standard. 
Mac Gaming. Have you tried gaming on a Mac? Well, it's possible, but it's usually not a good experience due to Apple rarely having hardware dedicated to it, like external graphics cards or the default peripherals that Macs come with seem to be a pain to use when gaming like the magic keyboard and mouse, and mainly due to the few amount of native games available for this platform. Yes, it has better support for native titles compared to Linux because of the bigger market share, but for the ones that don't support it natively, that's when you will find an issue and where Linux takes the spot as the second best desktop OS for gaming. You'll see. Apple is very restrictive with the graphics APIs that they want to support for the Macs. They want everyone to use Metal, their own API that, to be fair, almost none of the games are made with, as game companies prefer using something like DirectX, Vulkan, or OpenGL. This means that they probably would have to make a good rewrite of the game using Metal, and nobody wants to do that for a platform that, while well, does have good market share, isn't thought of as a gaming platform. Yeah, but they could just use Wine, right? Like on Linux. Yeah, they could and it works on some instances, but support for newer devices is getting trickier as the code would have to pass through several translation layers in the case of the Apple M SOCs. And again, they make it harder because Proton doesn't use Metal, it uses Vulkan. The best way of gaming on a Mac is by ironically virtual virtualizing Windows or by running iOS games, where they do have a great catalog with Apple Arcade. But you won't find your GTA 5s or Call of Duties here. I could probably make this entry a standalone video with more in-depth research, but I don't know, comment what you think about it. Apple Design Eras I'm going to quote a very good channel called Undefined that I've seen it's getting more recognition and they deserve it. I'll summarize their video but you'll have it in the top right corner in case you want to watch it. This user proposes 5 eras of Apple design, starting in 2000 to 2006 with the Aqua era that gets its name from its glossy, water-like look, being used at its fullest in macOS versions until Tiger and for the iMacs themselves. From 2008 to 2013, we have the Eskimorphic era, probably the most iconic one, and the one a lot of us grew up with. It uses textures that have depth and a more complex design, similar to objects from the real life. iOS used that until the release of its seventh major version. After Jobs' death, a new era starts from 2013 to 2017 that uses bright and saturated colors, simplified thin icons, and some blur. iOS is the best representation of this new era. 2017 would see the dawn of a new era that would not end until 2020, called the No Nonsense Era or the Ecosystem Era. You can guess by the name that it had a lot of new products like AirPods, the HomePod, the Apple Pencil, and iOS 11 that followed a similar design to iOS 10 but with bolder text and icons making it easier to see stuff. In 2020, we saw what in my opinion is one of the best eras, simply named the current era, bringing back the best elements from the previous eras, like colored iMacs and iPhones, flat sides, neomorphism and macOS, which to be honest, I want more companies adopting this, SOCs made by Apple, and more customization. Furphone Tired of disposable, quick, and garbage phones that barely get any updates and just add up to the already huge amount of e-waste, then the fur phone could be for you. It is built to be as sustainable, repairable, and recyclable as possible. The latest iteration of the series is the fur phone 4 that has 5G, a small notch, dual cameras, a Qualcomm Snapdragon 750G, and 128GB with 4GB of RAM. There are a couple of downsides though to begin with, the price is a little bit too expensive, but it could be totally justified to some of you, 580 euros. 
Availability is also limited to some countries of the EU and the US. Also, its display is IPS running at 60Hz, which could be a deal breaker for some of you. Updates, even though guaranteed, are really slow. The phone still has Android 11. However, I still think that it's nice to see something fresh in such a saturated market. Tier 5 DOS the Disk Operating System, aka DOS, usually refers to MS-DOS, but there are also another variations called IBM PC DOS and FreeDOS, an open source version of DOS. It is a single user, single tasking system, in which then later Windows was based on, which is one of the reasons it lacked a lot of features initially like multiple users and permissions. Web OS. It is a source available Linux based system made mainly for smart TVs, even though it has been used as a mobile OS too. As far as I know, it is not based on Android, so you cannot silo Android apps on this system. I have used it, and screencasting has not been that easy in my experience. I think you have to download an app, whereas with Android TV, you just cast it from the OS. So I think I prefer Android TV. Android powered by Linux. If you didn't know, Android uses the Linux kernel. That is why if you download a terminal emulator, you can execute some Linux commands, but not all of them because Android doesn't have the GNU utilities. The system also shares some interesting characteristics like using MIME types to guess what program to open a file, using a dot before a folder's name to hide it, and app package names. When you check the kernel version, that is the version of the Linux kernel that you're using iPod games. This refers not to third-party games that you can install on an iPod Touch via the App Store, but to the games that were pre-installed on the original Clickwheel iPod, like Breakout, a game that actually was invented by the co-founder of Apple, Steve Wozniak. Later revisions of the iPod added Parachute, Solitaire, and Music Quest. Activities an activity is basically a full screen page that displays content, and that is what Android apps are made of. They can also be presented as floating windows. Activities can overlap previous ones, but these last ones can still be retained in memory. A very good example of this is when you're going through some menus in the settings app. An activity has four states. The first one is when it is active. That means that it is the one that the user is currently interacting with, and it is at the highest position of the stack. If the activity activity has lost focus but it is still shown, its state is visible. In this case, the activity maintains its state and information as well as remaining attached to the window manager. If an activity is obscured by another one, then it is stopped. It retains all information but could be killed by the system when memory is needed. When the system wants to kill an activity, then its state is destroyed and has to be loaded again if you want to display it to the user. Android Manifest.xml The Android Manifest is an XML file that every app has and that declares the most important things like all the activities, services, broadcast receivers, and content providers. Here you can also find all the permissions the app needs as well as the name, icon, and package of the name itself. Windows Scout Mode this is a series of 262 shortcuts for settings, from known and easy ones to hidden ones. To get access to it, copy this string that you are seeing right now, and then create a folder wherever you want. Paste the text as the folder name. The folder will become a shortcut with a control panel preview icon that once opened will display all the setting shortcuts. Clippy. Clippy or Clippit was an assistant for beginners introduced in Microsoft Office 97, but it was removed in Microsoft Office 2007. It had the appearance of a paper clip with eyes, and its job was to help the users to get their work done quickly, but it was hated back then. 
because most users consider that intrusive and annoying, forcing the Redmond's company to turn the feature off by default in Office XP. In July 2021, Microsoft tweeted an image of Clippy and said that if the tweet got 20,000 likes, they were going to replace the paperclip emoji on Microsoft 365 with Clippy. It got even more likes than they were asking for and announced that they were going to replace it. But to this day, I don't know if they actually did it. Windows S Mode This is a special version of Windows that does not allow installing any programs that are not from the Microsoft Store, and it forces you to only be able to use Edge. It comes pre-installed in some laptops but can be disabled, allowing you to download usual apps. I do not know who thought it was a good idea, as most programs are not on the Microsoft Store, but well. Pirated Windows versions. This was more popular with older versions as Windows 10 started to allow users to use it without a license but with limited features. You could often find computers with pirated versions of the OS on places like schools or internet cafes. I remember that one of my schools used pirated versions. Android killed all mobile OSs except iOS. Like it or not, today we just have two main mobile OSs, Android and iOS. These are the ones that survived the competition, which included some other software like Symbian, which became outdated, Windows Mobile that lacked a lot of apps, mainly from Google, likely on purpose, Tizen, which I think nobody actually used, and Firefox OS that was promising but never caught on. I think that the reason why they became mainstream was because iOS brought something new to the market and Apple was already a big brand to back it up. Speaking about Android, I think that it was because it was the first open source phone OS, which allowed a lot of brands to adopt it quickly. Currently, the only competition these giants have are Linux phones, like the Pi phone or Librem 5, but these are definitely not ready at all and still have a ton of issues, but it's the best we got. You might have heard of Kai OS, but that one doesn't really try to compete with Apple and Google's creations. It is based on Firefox OS and its main goal is to try to make dumb phones a little bit more modern, but nothing more really. Custom ROMs a custom ROM is an alternative operating system based on Android that can be installed on supported devices that have an unlocked bootloader. It is mainly useful to get another software if you don't like the stuck one or if your phone won't get any more updates and you still want to be up to date. Some of these offer a very vanilla experience in favor of battery life and stability, sometimes allowing you to de-google the phone like Aero OS or the most popular ROM, Lineage OS, that is the successor of Cyanogen Mod. Others provide a more complete experience with more features like Pixel Experience that tries to replicate the feeling of Google Pixel phones. There are ROMs that focus on gaming and full customization such as CR Droid, and Calyx and GOS are privacy and security focused ROMs that make improvements to AOSP focused on the things previously mentioned. For example, being the Google Googled, scrambling the passcode keypad, and having a firewall. Most of these are open source, so you can contribute to them if you like. Keep in mind that individual developers work on them, not big corporations. Custom ROMs are usually device specific, so not all phones will be able to install one, but some projects publish a ESI that stands for Generic System Image, basically allowing you to install it on all phones that support the project Trouble, which are most these days. The bad thing about these OSs is that in most cases, you lose support for the original camera app of your phone, so you will not be able to take full advantage of all the lenses. There are some exceptions though, like ANX camera, and it's nice to see them. Android X86 Android has been relying officially on the ARM architecture, as that is the one most phones have these days. However, there are some projects that take care of porting Android to the architecture that most PCs still have, and that is x86 or x64, meaning that you can install it on these devices. Because the green OS supports mice, keyboards, and a lot of other devices, it usually works very well on PCs, and I guess the experience will be better when they support Android 
Tovel that improves a lot the UI and UX for large screen devices. Some of the reasons why you would want to install this could be to revive an old PC, to play mobile games in a big screen with controllers or other peripherals, or also to make your own TV box like we've seen before. If you're interested, I will mention some OS's that allow you to do this, like Remix OS, Phoenix OS, Prime OS, Bliss OS, and Open Thoughts. Android Studio. This is the program that is used to develop native applications for Android and its variations like Wear OS and Android TV. It allows you to code, design UI, compile, and test your program with the emulator or by connecting your phone with the USB debugging enabled. It's based on JetBrains' IntelliJ IDEA being available for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. The latest stable release is Android Studio Chipmunk from May of 2022. Windows Hidden File Explorer Windows 10 has a hidden file explorer based on UWP with Fluent Design. It is mostly an experiment because it is very basic, missing some important features. To get access to it, you have to create a shortcut with a weird string similar to what you need to do to get the gut mode. Weird iTunes Facts Barely anyone uses iTunes today as it has been replaced with Apple Music, but there are a couple of interesting and weird facts about iTunes, starting with the terms of service that state, quote, you also agree that you will not use these products for any purposes prohibited by United States law, including without limitation the development, design, manufacture, or production of nuclear, missile, or chemical or biological weapons. The second weird fact is that for one version, iTunes had this abomination, vertical traffic lights. In the mini version of this window, it makes sense, but in a normal window, it really looks bad. And in a window with title bar, it looks worse. And what powers iTunes is pretty old, as it was made with web objects, a technology from 26 years ago made by Next, and then acquired and maintained by Apple. Terminal emulators for Android. There are terminal emulators for Android, being the most popular one, the open source Termix, that allows you to execute some commands, install packages, and it's mainly useful if you have root, as some Majesk modules don't have a UI and to set them up, you need to use the CLI. Xcode it's the IDE used to develop native software for iOS, macOS, iPadOS, watchOS, and tvOS. It is only available for macOS, so to make a native app for these platforms, you have to get a Mac. Also, to publish apps on the App Store, you have to pay a $100 yearly subscription. Pretty expensive, if you ask me. Test Mode this is a mode that lets you install unsigned drivers and test them. Whenever Windows detects that you installed an unsigned driver, it will store it in the test mode, indicated with a watermark that has information like the build number and addition. You can go back to the default mode by executing some commands. Packet Capture this is an app that, by using a VPN, allows you to see all the traffic that your phone has in the background without root. It also lets you see the contents of this traffic, even though most of it is obviously going to be encrypted. Only use this for educational and debugging purposes. Consoles running Android an article by Trusted Reviews says that Nintendo originally wanted to make a portable console, most likely the Switch, run a modified version of Android. They believed this because the executive chairman of Cyanogen Mod, Kurt McMaster, published an outdated tweet that claimed that in the early days of Cyanogen, Nintendo wanted them to make an OS for them, but they rejected them. It is believed that the Switch now runs a modified version of BSD along with some Android code, but nothing is confirmed of course. But you know the modern community, they always find a way, achieving to make the Switch 
actually run Android 10, as you can see in this report by XDA developers, it can even run some emulators. Speaking about consoles really running Android, you've probably heard of the Oya. It was an Android console founded by Kickstarter, raising over $8 million, but it ended up being a failure, discontinued two years after its release. Also, the Oculus Quest 2, 1 and Pro all run a fork of Android, so you can install Android apps on it as long as they don't depend on Google Play services. Patch Tuesday after a Windows update, a patch fixing bugs of the previous update is released on Tuesday, hence the name. It occurs on the second or fourth Tuesday of each month. Android Design Errors like with every UI, the green OS has had a couple of design errors that follow the trends of different times. A channel that I found while making this video called Undefined made a great video about it. I'm going to summarize their work, but I recommend you to go and check it, it's criminally underrated. This was not sponsored, by the way, I have like 2000 subs, so it wouldn't even be worth it. They propose 6 errors of the UI design, starting with the primitive era between 2008 and 9, including 1.0. Cupcake and Donut, it can be described as having a detailed and cartoonish style, but it was very inconsistent as some apps had a dark or light theme without any standard. Comprised of Eclair, Frojo, and Gingerbread, we have the pre-Holo era that is an in-between the previous one and the Holo era, mixing some elements of the primitive era but simplifying a lot of the icons and making it more consistent. Moving on with the Holo era that features Ice Cream Sandwich, Jelly Bean, and Kit Kat, thanks to Project Butter, the smoothness and usability of the OS improved a lot. Things got cleaned up and a dark theme was standardized for all system apps. Kit Kat changes things a little bit, mainly making them brighter. Next, the paper cut era with lollipop, marshmallow, and nougat. It flattened all the icons, added drop shadows, pointed corners, and floating buttons, thanks to the introduction of the first material design. Oreo started the no frills or clean era that finished with Android 11. It focuses on practicality and cleaner, more rounded looks. The latest one introduced with Android 12 was the material U era that based everything on the color of your wallpaper, adapting all the apps that support it to a new palette each time you change it. It is way more rounded, but also has some interesting shapes. Even though it's my favorite one, I think it wastes space in some elements. App Cloning this is a feature available in some skins that allows you to have the same apps but several times, each one having their own data. In MIUI, this is called dual apps. This is useful, for example, when you want to have multiple profiles on social media or you want to have different save files in games. If your skin doesn't support this, there are other alternative ways of doing it, like with this app called App Cloner that does the same thing. But some people probably didn't know that you can actually do this and stock Android without any third-party apps, or well, it's very similar, by just creating another user account. It will have their own apps, data, wallpaper, and everything. Fuchsia OS this is a new operating system that Google has been developing for a while and that we barely know anything about. It's named after the color fuchsia that is a combination of pink, which was the codename of Apple's advanced pink OS of the 90s, and purple, also the codename of the first generation iPhone. So we can have an idea that Google is probably planning something very big with this project. The company hasn't said a lot about it, being the first time we knew about it in 2016, after media outlets Let's reported a mysterious source code repository on GitHub. Inspection of the code suggested its capability of being able to run on multiple devices like traffic lights, watches, phones, tablets, and PCs. Fuchsia OS doesn't have a Linux kernel like Android and Chrome OS do. It has its own one called Zircon that is inspired by Unix kernels but has some differences with them, like representing resources as objects instead of files. In 2021, thanks to a software update for the Google Nest Hub, its previous Chromecast-based software was replaced with Fuchsia OS. Even though there are no visual differences, so you wouldn't be able to 
Intel. It is planned for Fuchsia to have something codenamed as Stornex that would be a compatibility layer making it able to run Android and Linux apps. Because of this, a lot of people think that this project could be not only a replacement for Android but also for entire Linux based OSs in general. But again, this is only a speculation. Lucky Patcher it's an app that requires rip privileges that claims to be able to unlock locked content from an app or game, get in-app purchases as well as paid apps for free, and block ads from applications. I don't think this is very illegal, so I would not recommend you to use it. Also, because if Google finds out that you use it, it can terminate your account. Modded Windows Versions like Android's custom ROMs, there are modded and unofficial versions of Windows like the Windows 10 Ameliorated Edition that claims to remove all the unnecessary bloatware and even some stock programs. There are other versions that claim to improve performance and focus on gaming, but I wouldn't install one if I were you. Remember that this is a closed source operating system, so the people that make these versions don't really know what they could be removing, think that does not happen with Android and its custom ROMs, for example, as Android is open source and anyone that has the knowledge required can understand how it works. Don't set this as your wallpaper. In early 2020, this picture became viral, but not for good reasons, as it was crashing or even soft breaking Android phones that run Android 10 or below. Why? Well, it turns out that Android uses the sRGB format, but this image uses RGB, which Android fails to convert to sRGB, something caused accidentally by the photographer, as they edited the photo on Lightroom and used it on their iPhone, so they never found out about it until it became viral. Setting this as your lock screen wallpaper will cause your phone to crash every time that you see it and that will provoke a boot loop. Seeing the image and downloading it won't cause anything, only setting it as your wallpaper will. It has been fixed with Android 11 though, but don't ever try to do it if you're on a previous version. Bill Gates stole the graphical user interface concept. It is said that Microsoft was working with Apple to port Office to the original Macintosh, being allowed to get access to the Mac's graphical interface to test the software that they were developing. Sometime later, Microsoft released Windows 1.0, featuring the concept of a graphical user interface with resizable parts. Of course, Apple sued Microsoft, claiming that they copied their concept. The case ended five years later in favor of Microsoft because the court said that the graphical user interface concept cannot be copyrighted. Some people say it was fair because Apple stole the idea itself from Xerox, but some others say it was unfair. Let me know your opinion in the comment section. The Googling the Googling is the process of removing Google Play services and any Google app from your phone. This can be done easily by installing a custom ROM that doesn't include them with what it's usually called a vanilla build. You can find these on some ROMs like LNHOS or AeroOS. Keep in mind that as we've mentioned before, a lot of third-party apps also depend on GMS, so they will stop working or have limited functionality without these libraries. For example, Uber doesn't work because it uses the Maps API. Anything with in-app purchases won't work either, and apps that use Firebase to send notifications won't ever send them. But if you just like a middle ground, there is something called MicroG. This is an open source GMS spoofer that lets you have some more functionality, while keeping your privacy and most of the benefits of doing the practice in this entry. Even though, I would not recommend you to link your Google account to MicroG, as it is said that if the company that tech that you're using it, it can terminate your account. You can also use a Play Store alternative called Aurora Store that has literally the same apps but allows you to download them without the need of signing in. There is an app called Plexus that shows you a database of apps ranking them with two values according to how well they work without the services and how well they work with MicroG. It is very similar to something like ProtonDB. Sounds like such a pain and a big sacrifice, so 
So, why would you want to do this? Well, there are some pretty good reasons actually. Because you have no play services, you can be sure that there is no tracking, as Google doesn't include that at the AOSP level because if it did, it would have to be open source. Not having them also means a performance and battery increase. I've heard that battery life doubles in the Google phones, but I cannot confirm it. Also, you won't see any ad powered by the Alphabet's company in your apps. Linux it is a monolithic kernel written by Linus Torvalds. Its main characteristic is that it is licensed under the GPL license that makes it free and open source. This means that everyone can contribute to the development or even make its own modified versions of it. In 1991, Linus started working on the kernel as a hobby when he was attending the University of Helsinki with the goal of creating a system like Minix that is a Unix operating system. That is why Linux shares a lot of similarities with Unix and it is considered a Unix-like system. The name Linux was adopted from its creator's first name, just replacing the S with an X. At the time of this recording, the latest stable version of the kernel is 5.17. Android Modes there are a lot of Android modes, but the main ones, or the ones that most phones have, are the bootloader or fast boot mode that lets you boot to the system or to the recovery and also to flash stuff but only with ADV. In Xiaomi devices, this mode has a bunny that is its mascot. If you boot to the recovery, you will be able to wipe the data of your phone and if you use a custom recovery, you can flash ROMs or other things without the need of using ADB in a computer. If you decide to boot to the system instead, depending on your phone, if you hold down the volume down button, you will boot into safe mode that will only include the apps that originally came with your phone. This is useful if you have a third party app that is causing your system to fail. There are more obscure modes, usually exclusive to certain companies like Motorola that is the king of these modes. I will only mention them quickly as they tend to be very similar, starting with upload, ram dump and crash mode that is basically a kernel panic screen, like Unix systems BSOD. In Lenovo, Motorola and LG phones, there's the factory mode that lets you test how well the hardware is working. Lenovo and Motorola again have the meta mode that allows a phone to update or reinstall software, but some people say it's just fast boot. For Samsung products, you have the maintenance mode, making you able to choose between the bootloader, recovery, safe mode, and factory reset. Also, the download mode that is like fast boot but without the ability of executing commands, and only being able to flash with a specific manufacturer tool like Odin. In some Pixel phones since Android 10, you get the rescue mode that surprisingly, it isn't very clear what it is for. It only says that it's waiting for rescue commands, but it seems to be made for technicians to be able to repair a phone, registering new parts with commands or something like that. Finally, meet the Qualcomm ADL mode that is used to flash custom ROMs via a special tool. You can not modify this mode having to physically open the phone to fix a brick. Forensic companies discovered a vulnerability in the mode that let them extract data from locked screens. Alternative Stores Google's OS allows you to use third-party apps other than the Play Store. For example, you have the Aurora Store that allows you to download the exact same apps that are on the Play Store but anonymously, even though you do have to sign in to purchase apps. It tells you the permissions and trackers that apps come with. It's very useful if you plan to the Google. But if you're a free software enthusiast, you should probably use Fdroid that is a store where you can only find open source software. It looks a little bit dated and is slow when syncing repositories, so I would recommend you to use a better client like Droidify or the Neo Store that have a more up-to-date design and more features. Other companies try to not rely too much on Google and have made their own stores, like Samsung's Galaxy Store or Huawei's App Gallery. They're not as popular as the default store, but they do have some apps that you probably use. Claire is the dark cow. 
For the original Macintosh, a font was developed called Cairo, but this one had icons instead of text characters. The icon for the letter Z was this one, an animal that looked like a dog, but also like a cow. Then it was named Clara's the Dog Cow, being displayed in other parts of documentation and software, even though it's a little bit hard to find her nowadays. Distributions a Linux distribution is an operating system that uses the Linux kernel. There are about 500 active Linux distributions. Right now you are seeing the Linux distribution timeline that shows all of the Linux distros when they were made and what they're based on. The main Linux distros, that means the ones that have an important amount of Forex or Debian, Slackware, Ubuntu, Red Hat or Fedora, Arch Linux and Gentoo. Usually there are distributions for every case. For example, Arch Linux and Gentoo are for very advanced users. Linux Mint welcomes beginners and Ubuntu Touch is specialized for mobile devices. There are also distributions of other operating systems like BSD distributions and Android distributions. Steam Deck the Steam Deck is a handheld gaming PC developed by Valve and AMD, released on February 25th of 2022. This device runs SteamOS 3.0 that is a Linux distribution made by Valve based on Arch Linux. This console runs native Linux games, of course, but it also uses the Proton compatibility layer to be able to run a lot of Windows games. And because Windows has a big catalog and also considering that you can set up console emulators, it makes the Steam Deck look like a very promising device. Some people, including me, have the hope that it will increase the Linux market share enough for developers to start caring about it. Running other software on Android devices Using software like Andronix, you can install a Linux distro on your phone without the need of having to root. Even though if you do have it, you can install Kali Linux for educational penetration testing. If you wish to do so, you can completely replace Android with Linux by installing Ubuntu Touch if your phone is supported. Thanks to Android 13's improved virtualization support, Twitter user at KDragon was able to run Windows 11 under Pixel 6. Interestingly, it seemed to adapt fine to the phone's resolution, but it was barely functional due to the lack of hardware acceleration. Columbia Cicada, previously known as Cider, also allows the native execution of iOS apps on Android. Here's a picture of it running iTunes on an Android tablet. Removal of iOS features when Apple removes stuff like the headphone jack or the charger, people get outraged. But I've noticed that when they remove software features, barely anyone notices. <laughs> For example, rotating the home screen on an iPhone was possible, it adapted itself well to landscape mode, but this is not the case anymore, at least for iPhones that have notches, as rotating the screen would look weird I guess? But another reason could be that widgets make it harder for the home screen to rotate. Even though that is not completely the case as an iPad OS, you can rotate the screen with widgets. Probably I will unlock a little bit of nostalgia for some of you if I show you these forgotten apps, Newsstand and Game Center. A lot of people got confused with Newsstand as it wasn't just the app but more like a custom folder where you had all your magazines, books, and news. Originally, you couldn't move newsstand into another folder because, well, it was a folder itself, <laughs> but later that was enabled. It was confusing for a lot of us, and because I never bought anything, I always had that section empty. It was replaced with Apple News and iOS 9, though. But one that had more functionality was the Game Center. This app showed you the leaderboards and achievements for games, allowed you to add friends, play with them and more stuff. It was removed in iOS 10 but returned in iOS 14. Xerox Park 
Park, standing for Palo Alto Research Center, is a division of Xerox mainly focused on experimenting with new stuff. The legend says that Jobs visited this place and saw the potential of the graphical user interface copying it and implementing it on the Apple Lisa and later for the Mac. The stuff developed by the chats in this place was really innovative and very ahead of its time. Here, the laser printers bit map graphics, GUI, Ethernet, object-oriented programming, and more were invented. Sadly, this company was never really successful and struggled to find a way to capitalize on their achievements, thing that companies like Microsoft and Apple took advantage of. All Android phones have a codename. In case you didn't know, practically all Android phones from known companies have code names. This makes it very useful in the modern community to know exactly which device is which, skipping the branding or regional and modified it versions names. For example, you might think that stuff made for the Poco X3 NFC is compatible with the X3 Pro, but they're not the same phone, and you can confirm it by looking at the code names. One is Serja and the other one is Value. Windows Forbidden Folder Names There are some forbidden names that you can use for a folder. Some of these are Con, Com1, Box, and Null. Seriously, try to name a folder that way and you will not be able to do so. This happens most likely because those names match with keywords similar to the ones that the system uses in its code. Factory Reset Protection when your phone gets stolen, one of the first things the thief will do is to factory reset your phone. They can do this without having to crack your password by rebooting to the bootloader, then to the stock recovery that all phones have, and then they select the option to wipe data. But why is such a dangerous feature so easily accessible? Well, it turns out that it's a security feature. If you forget your password, then you will not be able to access your phone, being the only options you have to unlock it somehow, buying another one or factory resetting. This can also be used by people with bad intentions, but that's why it exists. Google understood this and starting with Lollipop, after factory resetting your phone and not signing out of your Google account, when you go through the setup process, it will ask you to sign in to the latest Google account linked to the device, stopping you from finishing the setup and thus being able to use the phone. I've seen that it can be bypassed, but probably they have already patched it. Because it is linked to your account, I guess that this won't work with phones that do not have GMLs. Apple Internal Apps this is going to become a video of its own, and it's probably going to be one of the first ones to be released in 2023, as there are a ton of Apple internal apps. But I'm going to quickly mention the most interesting ones. The most important one is Apple Connect, that lets workers sign into the company's network, which stores information for employees, as well as their permissions. Interestingly, this app uses a gesture-based password, thing that Apple never added to iOS probably due to not being secure enough. You install these apps with Switchboard, that is some sort of internal app store. Keep in mind that it's only used by people who work on Apple and getting a copy of this is not legal. By the way, this information is only for educational purposes, but still, because of the secrecy, it is believed that most of these apps have been discontinued. Brave lets Apple employees change the voice of Siri with properties like voice, gender, name, type, and more. Radar is used to report bugs with a high amount of importance, and text edit for iOS, it's like the Mac app, but for the mobile platform. Tux Tux is Linux's mascot. It is a penguin with a slight smile. It gets that name because penguins look like they're wearing a tuxedo, and Tux is a nickname for that. I mean, I guess that you can see the similarity. Also, James Huge said that this name stood for Torvalds Unix. In 1996, Linus Torvalds saw this exact image on an FPT server, and he liked it so much that it ended up being the inspiration for Tux. Eventually, Larry Ewing, 
submitted what would be the final Linux mascot design to a Linux logo contest. To design it, he used the first version of GIMP. Interestingly, Tux is not the logo of Linux, but the mascot. This is because Tux did not win any of the logo competitions, but pretty much everyone nowadays relates a penguin with Linux. There are multiple variations of the design. Here you are seeing a couple of them. But to be honest, my favorite one is the original design. The penguin was actually not the first proposed design. Alan Mackey made this concept for an alternate mascot, being this fox. Something pretty cool that I found while researching about this was that to raise money for a charity to help people that had been affected by a flood in Australia, Queensland, a flight took place and brought a tax plush to the space. Of course, you have the complete video in the description. Telemetry in Windows Windows collects your data. Remember that setup you had to complete when you first ran the OS? Well, in one of those pages, there are a lot of settings that, if turned on, which they are by default, give permission to Microsoft to get your data from small things that can seem insignificant, like software compatibility info, to some creepier ones like location and speech recognition. Of course, the company has its excuses of why it wants to get this data, like Cortana speech recognition or personalized ads, but what stops them from using it for other things? Desktop Environments a desktop environment is a graphical user interface that comes with some software pre-installed that is useful for the user, like a desk manager, a calculator, or a settings app. Every desktop environment has a different amount of customization and they follow their own guidelines. The most popular desktop environments are GNOME, KDE Plasma, and XFCE. Distros tend to customize the desktop environments to a certain degree to match with their S aesthetic, like the modifications that Ubuntu or Pop! OS make to GNOME, like adding a dock. Some distros even make forks of other DEs. This is the case of Cinnamon and Mate. Microsoft Edge's Monopolistic Practices with Windows 10, the Redmond's company replaced the hated Internet Explorer with Edge. The browser then arrived with some pretty questionable practices, from simple ones like displaying a big banner whenever you search for another browser, telling you how great Edge is and why you should stay, to some worse ones like sending you notifications about switching to Edge or directly setting Edge as your default web browser after an update. Regardless of your opinions about the web browser, this is a very abusive move and is still present with the new Edge version based on Chromium. In Windows 11, it is harder to switch to another browser, and even when you do this, some parts of the system like the search and widgets are hard-coded to open Edge. Package Managers a package manager is a software that takes care of installing, removing, and updating your packages. A package is a collection of files that usually are for a program. For example, Debian and Ubuntu-based distros use apt, the advanced package tool. Fedora uses DNF, that stands for Dendify Gem, and Arch Linux uses Pacman. Yes, like the game character. Usually, package managers are found in BSDs and in Linux, but macOS also has its own package manager called Brew. And in Windows, you have Winget, that not a lot of people use, <laughs> but it's still better than the default way of installing apps from websites. And yeah, I know about the Microsoft Store, but nobody uses that. Linus Torvalds Linus Torvalds is the creator and main developer of Linux. He was born on December 28th, 1969, being today 52 years old. Some people don't know that he also was the creator of Git, that stands for Global Information Tracker, and it is an open source version control system that it is used for a lot of big software projects. Most developers use it. Linus is also known in the Linux community for disliking a lot the company NVIDIA due to the difficulty of working with them. 
and the mediocre support that they offered to the system. He even showed the middle finger to them publicly and said the F word. Modded Apple Products A lot of people argue that Max should be touched and this is what the modbook tried to achieve. As the name suggests, this was a modded MacBook that ran OS X and had a touchscreen and a pencil, being more like a tablet. The first versions were sold, but after raising funds through a Kickstarter campaign, the company just disappeared. The least suspicious Kickstarter campaign. It seems like it was a common practice back in the day to install iPod Linux on Click wheel iPods. This showed you an iPod like UI with expected features like video and audio playback but also with some extra ones like games, emulators and even a freaking terminal. <laughs> a Mac Rumors forums user by the name of Hacker Wayne made a post showing his achievement. He installed OS X Snow Leopard on the first generation Apple TV. I know that you're asking yourself why? And he said that it was because he wanted to use the Apple TV as an iTunes streaming server. Another big mod took place in 2021 when engineering student Ken Pillanel made an iPhone with USB-C. This took a lot of effort as he had to reverse engineer the Lightning controller and perform some other amazing stuff. I recommend you to watch his video. The prototype was sold on eBay at approximately $5,000. Finally, a pretty amazing mod that not a lot of you know about is the secret iPod. This was made by an Apple engineer as a request from a defense contractor of the US Department of Energy. They wanted to add custom hardware to an iPod to be able to record data from its disk in a way that couldn't be easily detected. The author gives us some interesting details, like letting us know that the classic iPod OS wasn't based on Darwin. He created a hidden partition to store the data in. He thinks that they were making some sort of a stealthy gadget counter that is a device that measures ionizing radiation. Probably they wanted to get the data without alarming anyone, which is kind of alarming in itself. <laughs> Boot animation .zip. These are a type of zip files that you are able to move only with root to the slash system slash media directory. It will replace your stock boot animation with a custom one, even though it doesn't always work for all ROMs, but it's interesting to see that it's a thing. DistroWatch and DistroChooser DistroWatch.com is a website that ranks Linux and BSD distributions depending on how much people use them, based on how many times the download button is clicked on the official distro's website. Most people use it to see how popular a distro is. DistroChooser.de is another website whose purpose is to guide new users and help them to choose a Linux distro that suits their needs. It asks you some questions to know your preferences like the use case or if you prefer a Windows or Mac interface. I recommend you to go and visit it if you're planning on installing a distro, but if you don't know exactly which one. Richard Stallman Richard Matthew Stallman is an American computer programmer that was born on March 16, 1953 in New York. He is the founder of the nonprofit organization Free Software Foundation that promotes free and open source software. The goal can be summarized in one phrase. The users should have the freedom to run, edit, contribute to and share the software. Stallman also worked on the GNU project, same one that we're going to talk about in a minute. Lately, he has been a very controversial person because in 2019, he made some comments about a victim of that millionaire whose last name is similar to Einstein. You know who I am referring to. Later that month, he resigned from the MIT and the Free Software Foundation, but in 2021, he returned to the board of directors. This was met with a lot of discussion again, as a letter was published on GitHub asking for the removal of Richard Stallman from the Free Software Foundation, backed by organizations like GNOME and Mozilla. 
but they have not achieved what they wanted. Android 404 game from 2016 to 2019, you were able to play a little minigame if you encountered the classic error 404. That means that the page of a website doesn't exist. In the game, bug droids launch pink donuts, blue jelly beans, or white marshmallows to the center, and you had to rotate the glass pipes to send each dessert into its corresponding pipe. Now, if you get the same 404 error, you will just get a message but no game, so to play it, you have to use the Wayback Machine. <laughs> Linus breaking his system. On November 9th, 2021, one of the most popular YouTube tech channels, Linus Tech Tips, started a series of videos where Linus and Luke from Linus Media Group challenge each other to leave Windows behind and to switch to Linux for one month. Linus, being an advanced Windows user and knowing not a lot about Linux, faced some issues throughout the whole series, but the one that became a meme was when he was trying to install Steam on Linux, more specifically on Pop OS, by using the Pop Shop a program where you get your software from different repositories. It is known that the pop shop can be very buggy sometimes, and this happened at the worst moment, because when Linus installed Steam, he was presented with an error, being forced to install it via the terminal. This is when for some reason when executing the command sudo apt-get install steam, it intends to delete the whole desktop environment, asking for confirmation with the phrase yes, do as I say. Linus, very confused, typed that thing, nuking his entire OS, forcing him to try out another distro that did not have these issues. Android versions before 1.0 before the first official stable version of Android, there were some important releases. For example, the built HTC 2065.0.8.0.0, which is the earliest known build of our OS. It already had a search bar, a dock, an app drawer, a browser, Gmail, a notepad, context, calculator, SMS, and camera. Android M5RC14A was the first build to include touch UI support, a notifications panel, even though it was empty and new icons. Finally, we have Android 0.9, the final experimental version of the operating system, released along with the respective SDK. It is more familiar to what we now know, you can notice it by looking at the home screen. iPhones have Ethernet MAC addresses. I've never met anyone that connects their phone to the internet via Ethernet, as we usually connect them via Wi-Fi, but if you wanted to have all the benefits that a wired connection has, starting with iOS 10.2, you can now connect your iPhone with a lightning to Ethernet adapter directly to your router. I think this makes more sense in Android, as there are TV boxes, x86 distros, and Android TVs, but I guess it's fine to have the option on iOS too. GNU The GNU project started by Richard Stallman in 1983 because he wanted to create a free open source operating system alternative to Unix. GNU stands for GNU's Not Unix, making it a recursive acronym. It is a collection of 459 free and open source software packages essential for an operating system to work. Some components of GNU are the GNU Compiler Collection, the GNU C Library, the GNU Debugger, the GNU Core Utilities, and the GNU Bash Shell. One of the most important contributions of the GNU project is the GPL License, that stands for GNU General Public License. This allows software to be registered under a completely free license that forces everyone that modifies the project to also make its modifications open source. The GNU project was originally developing its own microkernel, called GNU Hurt, but sadly after 32 years it is still not ready due to a high amount of bugs and missing features. 
Now remember that Linux is essentially just the kernel, so it needs some software like GNU to be a fully working operating system. And because of the poor state of GNU herd, basically everyone that wanted a free system started to use Linux with GNU, because it was a working free kernel. And that's how we get what you've probably heard, GNU slash Linux. Some wallpapers are real. Look at the old Windows 10 wallpaper. You most likely think it was made with CGI, right? Well, not really. In 2015, Microsoft posted a video where you can see how they built a small room and used things like smoke machines, crystal, and lasers to create the wallpaper. Too bad it was replaced with a very similar one. I like both, but I think the newer one was made with CGI. I think that not everyone knows this because Microsoft deleted the video. Fortunately, a channel called Signum Game Studio re-uploaded the footage, even though it has a worse audio quality. The video is in the description if you want to see it. Of course, the Windows XP wallpaper is also from a real place, and the landscape Mac wallpapers are also real. Other objects running Android it is really interesting how Android can run on a lot of other objects. For example, it powers fridges like the Samsung T9000, thread mills, headphones, bicycles, cameras like the Samsung Galaxy camera, touch displays like the ones made by New Line Interactive, and even cases for iPhones. Yes, a case for iPhone runs Android. It's believed to be the OS used by the Facebook portal, Google Home, and Amazon Echo smart speakers. But the spot for the weirdest thing running it definitely goes to this urinal. Why does this thing even need to have a screen is beyond my understanding, but you can clearly see that it runs Google's OS. Shell A shell is a program that includes a command line interface, making you able to execute commands and programs. Bash is the GNU project's shell, standing for Born Again Shell. Most Unix-like OSs use it by default, like Linux and FreeBSD. macOS replaced it with the Z shell. There are other alternative shells that try to fit the necessities of other users like the Fish shell that features auto-suggestions based on history or the C shell that also has improvements over Bash. The OS Paradox Ever wondered why Windows Phone was not a success and why Linux struggles to grow? It is mainly for this what I call the OS Paradox. It basically consists of the lack of applications that the Windows Phone and Linux had that provoked that nobody wanted to get one of these phones and without users, developers didn't really want to make versions of their app to work on these phones with few users. This prevents the platform from getting new apps and again, without apps, apps, no users, and without users, no apps, thus creating a paradox that only forced the remaining few users to get another phone to be able to use applications like YouTube. This is a paradox from which almost all new operating systems that want to compete will suffer of, and that is why it is so hard to compete in the operating system market. OS Tans. An OS X is an anime character that represents an operating system. There are characters for Windows, Linux, and of course, Android. You're seeing the Android 10 right now, and yes, she has a USB-C tail. Let's not talk about it. Mac Servers if you know about servers, when installing an OS, you would most likely pick Linux or any BSD due to great security and being free as in price as well as in freedom. If you don't know that much about servers or Linux, you probably would commit the atrocity of installing Windows Server on a machine. But if macOS is a type of BSD, why is it not that popular for servers? Actually, there have been server dedicated versions of macOS, but it seems to not not have been that popular, probably due to high price and lack of upgradability on their Macs. Also, features of these versions were already bundled in the standard macOS, so it didn't make much sense to still have the server version, being discontinued in April of 2022. Raspberry Pi 
A Raspberry Pi is a very small and cheap single board computer that runs Linux most of the times, usually Raspberry OS, previously called Raspbian. It is used for a wide variety of projects because you can program it and modify it. People have created handheld gaming consoles with these or have even set up a Minecraft server. There are several models of Raspberry Pis, but the cheapest one is the Raspberry Pi Zero version 1 that costs about $5. Unix Usually, this term is used to refer to a type of operating system similar to Unix or the family of Unix-like systems, but Unix itself, it's its own OS. The development started back in 1969 at the Bell Labs by Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, and others. Characteristics of Unix are the root file system, modularity, support for multiple users and processes, and storing information in editable text files. The original Unix is proprietary, but there are multiple open source variations of it, like Linux, FreeBSD, and others. Pokemon Go deaths and injuries caused by phones. Do you remember 2016? Well, if you do, you know that it was ruled by Pokemon Go, that mobile game that used AR and location tracking to incite you to go out of your house and walk to find some Pokemon. The issue is that even when the game tells you to look at your surroundings, a lot of people didn't, and that caused a lot of accidents, from falling to crashing with some vehicles. Microsoft Bob this was a software whose purpose was to make Windows 3.1 more user-friendly. It was released in 1995 as a response to Apple's user-friendly Macintosh. Bob displayed different elements as if they were parts of a house. For example, clicking on a pen would open the notepad. It was hardly criticized for being too childish, expensive, and it required some very demanding hardware for the time. It ended up being discontinued just one year after its release. Custom Kernels Thanks to Linux and the AOSP, you're able to create your own custom kernels and use them with different ROMs. Some provide patches or fixes, performance or battery life improvements, or support for other devices or file systems. Some popular ones are the Sultan kernel, Arter 97 kernel, Elemental X kernel, Blue Spark kernel, and the Kurisakura kernel. Linux also has its own custom kernels, like the Linux Libre kernel that removes all proprietary blobs from the kernel and well that is what the FSF recommends you to use. Linux memes There are a lot of memes in the Linux community. First, we have the absolutely proprietary meme <laughs> That always makes me laugh. It's pretty absurd, but I really like that meme. <laughs> and well, you usually show it to a person that's using proprietary software. You also have the I use Arch by the way. Arch Linux is a distribution that came out in 2002 and that is known for being mainly for advanced users because you have to set up everything yourself. In 2011, the Twitter user XYLit0L <laughs> published this meme of a guy asking a girl if she knows that he uses Arch Linux being one of the first mentions found about this meme. But the first one that actually used the phrase itself is believed to be this one. A post on r slash Linux Master Race in 2017 using the mocking Spongebob format, making fun of users that comment the catchphrase. Nowadays, it is basically just used ironically and people have modified it to mention the distro that they use. For example, I use Fedora, by the way. There's also, I'd like to interject for a moment. This is another phrase that became a meme and it is used as a copy pasta. People use it as a satirical reply to people who call GNU slash Linux just Linux. I actually could not find the exact origin of the phrase and in the install Gento wiki it says that it is actually a fictional phrase attributed to Richard Stallman, but I've seen some people on reddit saying that it was from a real conference where he actually interjected. <laughs> 
To this copy pasta, a user frequently replies with another one also believed to be fictional that contradicts the first one. I was planning to read the whole copy pasta, but I suspect that this video is already getting long enough, so you'll have to conform yourselves with just the screenshot. There's also the year of the Linux desktop. <laughs> this is another phrase that became a meme in the community. You see, Linux and the desktop market hasn't really had a lot of success, but there's people that hope that when it reaches a good amount of users, or that when it is suitable for most needs, that is when the year of the Linux desktop will be. Some claim that it was in the 90s, others claim that in 2004, others that it was the year when you installed Linux, but still, most believe that it hasn't happened yet. Steve Jobs hated Android. Steve Jobs, the most iconic and important CEO of Apple, really disliked Android as he considered it a betrayal from Google because Apple worked with them in the development of the iPhone. And you can notice that by looking at one of the apps that came pre-installed with the original iPhone being one of the maps powered by Google Maps. This was very similar to what had already happened to Apple with Windows, claiming that Microsoft stole the GUI concept. To reinforce Steve's hate, towards Android, here's a quote that he said, taken from the book Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. I will spend every penny of Apple's 40 billion in the bank to right this wrong. I'm going to destroy Android because it's a stolen product. I'm willing to go through a nuclear war on this. Windows Subsystem for Linux WSL is short for, well, Windows Subsystem for Linux, and it is basically a program that you install from the Microsoft Store on Windows 10 or 11 that allows you to choose from a wide variety of distros like Ubuntu or Kali Linux and run Linux apps on Windows, creating a whole subsystem with its respective files inside Windows. At first, it only ran command line interface apps like Nano or some scripts, but with the release of the Windows subsystem for Linux 2, it got the ability to also run GUI apps. This is useful mainly for developers, and an average user may not even know about this, but some people claim that this is Microsoft trying to kill the Linux desktop, using the very known technique of embrace, extend, and extinguish that Microsoft has used with Netscape, for example. I don't really know what to think about this last theory, but as far as I know, the Linux compatibility is not really perfect and has limitations. Apple Internal Apple Internal is a folder that rarely appears after restoring a Mac running Catalina from a Time Machine backup, and it seems to be most of the times empty. It is believed that this folder contains tools for Xcode that aren't released to the public, that once Xcode detects it, enables hidden features. Android Forensic Tools Forensic science takes care of collecting evidence for an investigation. This also includes digital evidence like chats, photos, videos, and files. That's why there are forensic tools designed to exploit some vulnerability on your phone with the objective of getting information from you. Some of these programs or companies are Celebrite UFED, Oxygen Forensics, Magnet Axiom, Mobile Edit, and MD Next. If you're planning on going to download any of these programs, let me tell you that they only usually sell them to organizations or governments, not to individuals. They should only be used to gather evidence of a suspect, not by people to spy on other people. Neofetch NeoFetch is a command line interface program made by the user Dylan Everapps, registered under the MIT license, that when executed, tells you a summary of information about your system, like what distribution you're running, on what hardware, and how many packages you have installed. To be honest, the main thing that people use it for is to brag after installing Arch or any hard distro, or actually to brag about any that's true that you're using in general. Knowledge Navigator 
This is an Apple commercial from the 80s that showed a concept of how this company thought technology would be like in the future. They got a lot of things right, like touch tablets, virtual assistants, and video calls. May 23rd, One UI Book. On May 23rd of 2020, in China, Samsung phones like the S8, S9, S10, and S20 series faced a serious bug where some of them would crash and reboot to their recovery. This happened because May 23rd is a date related to China's lunar calendar, causing the system to calculate this time incorrectly and then fail if you didn't update the calendar app before this date. The solution was to change the date to one month earlier or to update the calendar app but I think this is something that we all wouldn't want to happen to us. Windows XP Source Code Leak On September 24th, 2020, a comment on 4chan leaked the source code of Windows XP Service Pack 1 and 2003 server. Most of the code was written in C and C++. The code also contained a lot of words like hack in reference to the fact that maybe that line of code was just a temporary fix, as well as some references and some cursing that I cannot read to you because YouTube. Everything sounds funny until you start realizing what this actually means. Remember that there are a lot of people that still use old Windows versions, mainly ATMs and hospital computers, so this code could still be there to this day. And now that it is exposed, and a lot of computers could be vulnerable to hackers. Some conspiracies say that the entity that leaked this code could have been Microsoft itself, that knew that if it released the code, it would leave some older computers exposed to an attack. For Forcing them to update to newer versions that still have support. Tizen. This is a GNU slash Linux OS backed by the Linux Foundation, intended for mobile devices with the goal of competing with Android, but as we know, it was never popular, only being used mainly by Samsung on their watches, and since their partnership with Google, they seem to be only using it on their TVs. APK Tool This is a program written in Java licensed under the Apache 2 license that lets you reverse engineer APK files. I really don't know why would you want to do that other than trying to recover your own app's lost source code, which has actually happened to me. But if you try to do it for other apps, then I don't know how legal that is, as some consider reverse engineering the source code as violating the copyright. So don't try it. Steve Jobs tried to hire Linus Torvalds. Around 2000, when Apple was working on the new Mac OS X, Steve Jobs met Linus Torvalds and tried to hire him, proposing to make Unix available for the biggest user base, but with the condition of stopping with the development of Linux. Linus refused, besides, he hated Mac OS X's match kernel. Hackintosh a Hackintosh is a PC that runs macOS. This can be achieved with different ways. I think one of the latest ones is to actually install Linux on your PC and use some sort of virtual machine to run macOS on it. Of course, Apple doesn't endorse you doing this. I think it can also be illegal. <laughs> It is also not very practical as whenever you update the operating system, it will usually break your computer and you'll have to do a lot of tinkering around to get it to work again. With the new Apple Silicon Max, it is believed that this practice is going to die as it is going to get way harder to emulate Mac OS. <laughs> Android originally meant for cameras. In 2013, Andy Rubin revealed that Android was originally meant for digital cameras. They wanted to create a platform where you would have cloud storage for images and videos without having to rely on the internal storage. He showed the idea to investors, but the idea didn't really caught on, claiming that, quote, it wasn't actually a big enough market. They changed focus to now design a smartphone OS. Google came in, bought the company, and you know the rest. 
Run Windows Software on Linux There are three main ways of running Windows Software on Linux or alongside with it. The first one is Wine. Wine stands for Wine is not an emulator, and it is a compatibility layer that allows you to run Windows apps on POSIX compliant systems like macOS, Linux, and BSD. Wine translates the Windows API calls into POSIX calls at runtime, which gets rid of all the performance decrease that you would get for running, for example, a virtual machine. Other technologies like Proton are based on Wine and tools like bottles make it very easy to use this technology. The downside is that because Windows is closed source, developers are basically trying to mimic how it works without knowing exactly how it works. This makes Wine not a very perfect compatibility layer, so you could have some issues with it, and software like drivers will not work with it. I'd say that for basic stuff, it is impressive how good it is, and I haven't had any issue with it, but maybe for some more complex stuff, it won't work properly. Properly. The second way of running Windows apps on Linux is with a virtual machine with Kimu, KVM, and GPU pass-through. As I've told you, running a virtual machine makes the performance worse, but if you figure out how to make a virtual machine with GPU pass-through, this VM will directly communicate with your GPU. Making graphics-related tasks like gaming almost as good as if you were running the software directly on your machine. Unfortunately for now, enabling this is not so easy for the average user, as you'll have to run some scripts, some commands, and change configuration files, but it is the definitive answer for running basically every Windows program that you want on Linux. Another not so usual downside is that specific programs like the ones a school would give you to prevent you from cheating on a test will try to detect if you're on a virtual machine. So that is another thing you'll have to deal with. And the last way to run Windows software is to not run it on Linux directly, but alongside with it. More specifically, to have a Linux partition with all your usual stuff and a Windows partition with all the Windows exclusive software. When you boot up your computer, Grub will let you choose what OS it should boot. This is called dual booting, and it is very easy to do, as beginner-friendly distros will help you to do it when you're installing them. But be careful, because I've heard a lot that if you install Linux and Windows on the same drive, when Windows updates, it will detect your Linux partition and will format it along with Grub. I wonder if Microsoft does this on purpose. The solution is to install them on different drives. False System Hierarchy Standard The False System Hierarchy Standard, or FHS, is a convention for how a Unix-like system is structured. It all starts with the root directory that is the parent of all the other directories. I am going to tell you a little bit about what the main folders are for. Slash bin has essential command binaries like cat or ls. Slash boot contains all the bootloader files. In a slash dub, you find all your connected devices. This is why you might have heard the phrase that everything is a file, because devices and other stuff that you wouldn't have thought about are actually files. Slash etc stands for etc, and you usually find system-wide config files in here. Slash home is the user's home directory, where they store documents, downloads, and that stuff. Slash lib is where the libraries for programs are stored. Slash media is the default mount point for removable drives like a USB or a CD. A slash mnt is a directory where you usually would manually install your drives. A slash opt is where you store the optional applications packages. A slash sbin saves all the essential system binaries. A slash proc stores all the processes that are actually files because, again, Everything is a file. A slash root is the root user's home directory. A slash TMP stores all the temporary files, like when you create a new unsaved document. A slash USR contains the majority of multi-user utilities and applications. 
slash bar has all the files that are expected to change at runtime, like logs. TTY TTY stands for Teletype Grader, and it is an abstract device in Unix-like systems at the kernel level that presents you with a command line prompt where you can execute commands. There are 6 TTYs and you can access one by pressing Ctrl plus Alt plus F3. Usually a TTY is used for troubleshooting or when your graphical user interface is not available. Special Edition Phones Sometimes companies make weird collaborations, creating some special edition phones like the Pepsi P1 and P1S. These were phones made back in 2016 with Pepsi branding. They were only available through a crowdfunding campaign on a Chinese site called JD.com. Interestingly, seems that the reviews were positive and that it was overall a good mid-ranger for its time and price. I also wanted to mention that I find funny and sad that this computer world review calls the phone a phablet, but it was only 5.5 inches <laughs> compared to the 6.6 .6 plus inches monstrosities that we currently have. It ran Ditto OS, an Android skin also available for some Doji phones. As expected, they were Pepsi themed. Also, Huawei partnered with Kentucky Fried Chicken to make 5,000 limited edition KFC phones, which are in reality just a special version of the mid range Huawei Enjoy 7 Plus. It had a 5.5 inches 720p display, a Snapdragon 435 SoC, a 12 megapixel camera, 3 gigabytes of RAM, and 32 gigabytes of storage running Android 7. It came with $10,000K, which is a virtual currency used by KFC in China, and there is a pre-installed music app that allows you to create playlists and share them in the restaurant. Overall, a unique phone, but I don't think anyone would be seriously daily driving it. It's very basic. Marshall, a music equipment company, made the Marshall London, a phone for artists. It was a very basic phone with a Snapdragon 410, but its media consumption capabilities are way above your average phone. For example, there are front-facing stereo speakers, a Sirius Logic sound card, and two audio jacks that can be used for listening and recording. Window Managers a window manager is a system software that takes care of controlling the placement and appearance of your windows and your graphical user interface. With this in mind, a tiling window manager is a window manager that tries to take advantage of all your screen real estate by opening programs in different sizes. For example, if you open a first window, it will appear maximized, but if you open a second window, the first one will take half of the screen same as the second one. A good amount of people prefer tiling window managers instead of using full desktop environments, creating a debate of which one is better. The most popular tiling window managers are i3, DWM, Osm, or Sway. Linux Audio and Display Technologies X11 or XORG is a windowing system created way back in 1987. It is the default display protocol for most distros. The way that it works is that the programs communicate with the X11 server before the compositor can generate the window that is needed for the application to render properly. It is reliable but very slow by modern standards. Wayland is another display protocol whose goal is to replace X11. The way it works is by using client-side rendering, allowing the programs to communicate directly with the compositor that it wishes to render a window for. This makes Wayland faster than XORG, but there are some problems currently, like screen recording, that needs pipe wire to work properly because in Wayland, windows are encapsulated and some programs rely heavily on X11. About Pulse Audio, it is a sound server for POSIX operating systems. This one is also the default for most distros and in most use cases it works just fine. Even though I've heard that some people have had problems with it, 
By default, it is configured to automatically detect all sound cards and manage them, taking control of all the detected ALSO devices and rendering all audio streams to itself, making it the central configuration point. But for low latency tasks like audio production, it is necessary to use a professional sound server API called Jack. Pipewire is a new server that handles not only audio but also video. It features some advantages over Pulse Audio, delivering a better security model that allows isolation between applications and secure access from within containers. It is also able to accommodate the professional use case, being able to replace Jack due to its low latency. I mentioned these technologies together because they seem to be in a similar state. New tech trying to replace old tech but they're not 100% there for all people. Even though distros like Fedora already include Wayland and Pipewire by default, so it is just a matter of time until all distros start using them. Apple Prototypes Before the final iPhone UI that we all know, there was this prototype called Acorn OS. This was very similar to the iPod's interface, including a click wheel, but everything was touch. Another prototype was this one, a flip phone in 1983 and a tablet-laptop hybrid. A color was named after Android. The color that you're seeing right now is called Android Green. It is a shade of Caribbean Green described by Google as the color of the latest design of Bugdroid. If you're curious, its hex value is 3DDC84. Boring Phone it's a phone that tries to bridge the gap between a dump and a normal smartphone, mainly for people who want to spend less time on their phones. They achieve this by only providing a set of average, boring, and useful tools, like a music player, calculator, gallery, notepad, calendar, clock, and voice recorder. The icons are not even in color to avoid provoking some emotion. It has some very basic specs, but I mean, you don't really need much. I think they're enough, as the phone probably doesn't even have GMS destructive commands. In Linux, the terminal is a very useful, powerful, and dangerous tool if you do not know how to use it. Trolls on the internet usually share destructive commands to new users and they end up destroying their systems. Today, I'm just going to show you three of them. Let's begin with this thing. Yeah, I know, it looks like a lot of gibberish, but you're actually declaring a function that inside of it calls itself and sends that output again to itself. This last thing runs in the background. The last character calls that function creating a loop that'll end up wasting all your resources and freezing up your computer, forcing you to restore it. This other command clears all the partitions that you have on your SDA drive, where you usually have the operating system installed. And this last one is the most popular one, sudo rm-rf slash, it deletes your root directory. There are also some variations, like the one adding a star at the end, that will delete everything on the root, and because of the Unix-like file system, this will delete all your data in all your connected drives. Linux phones this one refers to the fact that basically Android is a type of Linux because it uses the kernel, so Android phones are Linux phones, but a lot of people don't agree, and this is where real Linux phones come in. We're talking about phones that run an actual Linux distribution that is usually adapted to a mobile interface like Kitty, Plasma Mobile, or Fosh. Example of these phones are the Pine Phone and the Livem 5, devices that sadly really haven't had a lot of success compared to Android or iOS, so the market for them is still very small. With projects like Mbox or Wayjoid, that allow these phones to run Android apps, there is the hope that maybe they will eventually succeed, but we'll have to wait. Even Intel made an Android phone. 
This is the Intel AZ210. It runs Android Ice Cream Sandwich powered by an Intel Atom Z2460 processor. It came out back in 2012. I don't think it was very successful because how many Intel powered phones have you seen in the streets? Lockdown apps. There are apps like the one you're seeing right now that locks down your Android phone and only allows you to use certain apps. It also disables hardware buttons and status bars. If you ask me, I don't know how it is available on the Play Store, as blocking hardware buttons could be considered against the store's terms of service. I mean, it's almost malware and forcing someone to use it, even in a work environment, to me is one of the most toxic and dystopian things you can do. Weird apps. There are a lot of weird Android apps. I will only mention a few, starting with Shake Me. You have to do what the name of the app says, and when you do, a dancing Batman appears with music, that's such. But to be honest, it really did freak me out the first time that I saw it. I was expecting a jump scare, and I did kind of get it. The next step is called Send Me to Heaven, and encourages to throw your phone very high. Of course, this has the risk of damaging property, other people, and the phone itself. That's why you have to accept a bunch of warnings before getting to play the game. I don't recommend you to try it, I only did it for this video and you can see that my score is ridiculously low. The Abu Mu collection is a series of apps that cost $400 each, making a total of $2,400. What does it do then? Well, it just adds a gem widget to your home screen, that's it. It's like saying you're rich but without explicitly saying so. Remember gave the dog? Yeah, that dog that appeared on music memes. Well, there is an app that features him, where you can tap off one of the gapes that appear there and each one will bark in a different note. Brainwash is a generic puzzle game, but that features some very inappropriate minigames that you can have an idea of by just looking at the picture. For some reason, it is still on the Play Store. But Eat, the revolution, is definitely the weirdest app from the list. The game tells you to tap to bite food. With a couple of bites, you eat the food. Then a message appears and you have to repeat the whole process again. That is unusual, but when it gets really weird is after you restart the game a couple of times and keep playing for some minutes. Then you start to get weird objects to eat weak nasty shoes, teeth and baby dolls. Weird music and people laughing in the background starts to be heard. Then you run out of food and the credits appear. It looks like it actually has a meaning, or at least that's what the description of the app and messages lead me to believe. And my interpretation is that it has a critique against capitalism, where consumerism will lead us to a point where there will be no food left, and we will have to eat stuff that we're not supposed to to survive. Or they could just be trolling. Baby Shaker was a last iOS app that appeared on the App Store on April 20th, 2009, around the same time of the Shaken Baby Syndrome Awareness Week. The game had a picture of a baby and you had to shake the phone really hard, which caused the baby to, well, let's say disappear. People got outraged and the app was removed from the App Store. A successful re-upload happened the next day, but again was taken down and now permanently. Windows Refund Day on February 15th, 1999, it was the Windows Refund Day, where mainly Linux users went to Microsoft's offices to return their unused licenses of Windows that they were forced to get because they were bundled with the computer that they had bought. This may sound funny, but actually in the end user license agreement for Windows, it states clearly that if the user refuses the agreement, Windows can be returned to the manufacturer and they would get a refund. This was theoretically of course, and because almost nobody asked for a refund for Windows, manufacturers would usually refuse to make a refund because they would lose money. At the end of the day, these users were not able to get their refunds, but it was a pretty interesting day. Michael MJD has a very good video about this, and I'll leave it in the comments in case that you want to watch it. Minnesota University Ban 
In April 2021, two researchers from the University of Minnesota decided to submit buggy patches of the Linux kernel to study what would happen. They even released a paper explaining what they did and what was their goal. When the community found out, they removed the contributions that they submitted and the whole University of Minnesota was banned from contributing to the kernel. It was a very controversial thing when it was found, but to be honest, I do not know what they were expecting. <laughs> BSDs BSD stands for Berkeley Software Distribution and is a type of Unix-like system. There are BSD variations, probably the most popular one and the one intended for desktops is FreeBSD that has a monolithic kernel and is licensed under the license with the same name of the project. There are FreeBSD distros like Desktop BSD or TrueNAS. Dragonfly BSD is also used sometimes as a desktop OS, even though it doesn't seem to be as popular as FreeBSD. OpenBSD and NetBSD are designed to be very secure operating systems, mainly for servers. A lot of people prefer BSDs over Linux in the server space. I've heard that it's because they are usually more secure, even though Linux has a broader software catalog. For desktops, there are few people running BSD, but that doesn't mean that there aren't. A common joke is that Linux elitists will switch to FreeBSD once Linux becomes too mainstream. But keep in mind that because these OSs have a different kernel, they support less hardware than Linux does and again usually have less apps. Game consoles usually also run a type of BSD, as because of their license, they don't have to make their forks open source. Reportedly, PlayStation and the Switch run some sort of BSD, but I don't think the Xbox does, as it probably runs a custom OS made on top of Windows's NT kernel. Weird Sunks and Features Samsung is not afraid of experimenting. They have made some weird features, for example, the Samsung Air View that will perform an action, usually a preview, when you hover your finger or the S Pen over the area that you're interested in. This is taken a step further with the Air Gestures that let you move your hand over the screen of your phone to accept calls, move between pictures or pages, and to wake your phone up. Samsung Smart Scroll moves the content that you're seeing when you tilt your head. Smart Pause pauses the video that you're watching, but when you're not looking at the screen. These all seem very gimmicky to me, but I really have to admit that they were a lot of years ahead with the smart rotation feature. Like the name suggests, this is basically auto rotate but based on your face. If that sounds familiar, it is because Android 12 introduced it, but they had it all way back since Android KitKat. A weird fact is that the S4 and Note 3 had temperature and humidity sensors for some reason. It seems that it was just something used to get that information, but nothing more. Linux is free if you don't follow your time. There is an old saying, Linux is free if you don't value your time. Basically, this refers that while Linux is free, you might have to pay by spending a good amount of time learning how the system works, getting used to it or researching how to fix some problem or how to get a program that you need working on Linux. So you would be better off by just paying to get Windows or Mac OS to avoid wasting your time. In 2018, the YouTube channel TechLead uploaded a controversial video where he says why he thinks that the phrase is right, and that basically due to poor software compatibility and other reasons, Linux can be a waste of time. This video didn't really get a lot of positive feedback, and other YouTubers like Mental Allo replied to him, contradicting what he said. Exiting Vim Vim is an open source terminal based text editor that is highly configurable and has some powerful features. 
However, one of the most common complaints is that Vim has some very weird shortcuts and that a lot of beginners don't really know how to exit Vim. This has become a meme not only among Linux users but also programmers in general. To exit Vim, you have to exit the edit mode and enter the command mode by pressing the ESC key, then type a colon and Q to quit the editor. Ubuntu and Amazon In 2021, when Ubuntu was using its own desktop environment called Unity, Canonical added a new feature that made it so that when you opened the dash menu and typed something, you would get your usual results but also web results from Amazon, and its web apps were also included by default. This was a very criticized decision because it sent your keystrokes to Amazon, so much that even Richard Stallman said that Ubuntu was now spyware. Eventually, they removed that feature but the web apps were still present until 2020, when the Amazon shortcut that was present in the dash was removed. Libre Booting Libre Boot is an open source boot firmware founded in December of 2013 that initializes the hardware and stores a bootloader for your operating system. One of its goals is to replace the proprietary BIOS or UFI firmwares that your computer most likely has. It is a distribution of core boot, but with all the proprietary binary blocks removed from it. It currently supports 32 and 64 bit systems and the ARM architecture. Android on RISC 5. RISC 5 is a new open standard instruction set architecture. Android wasn't really made for it as it only supports ARM and x86, but it has already been ported to RISC 5. They were able to run a graphical interface powered by a T head processor. It is quite slow, but is able to launch a couple of AOSP apps. React OS Primarily written in C, React OS is an open source clone of Microsoft Windows created in 1998, licensed under the GPL2 that tries to replicate full compatibility with Microsoft's OS with the goal of replacing it. It was named this way because the development team were dissatisfied with Windows's monopolistic position and this was their reaction to it. The project is still in alpha, but regardless, it's pretty active and looks interesting. NSW Apps because you can sideload apps, you can install some that are focused on this type of stuff. It is more likely that these have a virus, at least compared to an average app from an official store. Of course, I won't share any links for them. This entry also refers to the fact that you can find this type of content in unmoderated social media apps like in Reddit, or that even some apps lately have been having some inappropriate apps, ironically, usually including YouTube. Siri, where can I hide a dead body? If you asked this to Siri, it would actually tell you where you can hide it, from places like dumps and swamps to mines. Nowadays, seems like this was removed, replying, I used to know the answer to this. Windows XP Horror Edition Created by a user with the name of Wabi Chip, this is a malware designed for Windows XP. The virus installs a fake update and when updating at 66%, an error message is shown saying that the setup will use a file called 666.sys. This is where everything starts to fall apart as the logo, background, and music are replaced with creepy versions of them. When your computer finally boots up, there will be a red background with a skull. Everything is creepier from the stored menu button that now says that to the sudden disturbing glitchy pictures that appear as your background. The task manager is disabled at launch so there is no easy way of stopping this. It is not recommended to try it out unless you use a virtual machine as it could really break your PC. iPhobia 
This is a hypothetical phobia towards eye devices and or people that use them. The causes could be nightmares about iPhones or being hurt by a user of one of these. Hexley some operating systems have their own mascots. Linux has Tux, Android has Bugdroid, and FreeBSD has BST. Following this trend, Darwin, the OS Apple systems are based on, has Hexley the Platypus as its mascot, designed by John Hooper when the developers decided to have a platypus mascot. It was named after Darwin's assistant, who was supposedly called Hexley. ADT1 this was a developer kit for Android TV and the first device to run it. It was not required to get it to make apps for this platform, but it was a useful tool for the ones that wanted a more accurate experience. As you can notice, it had an HDMI, USB, Ethernet, and power ports. It came with a controller that looks similar to the one that the Xbox has. Chirp was ported to the ADT1, giving you the possibility to root it. Tor it's a browser available for multiple platforms, including Android, designed specifically for anonymity, security, and privacy. It works through something called onion routing that encrypts everything that you do several times. Basically, nobody can track you if you use it. It has legitimate uses like circumventing censorship and protecting yourself from trackers, but because it gives you access to .onion domains which are only accessible by Tor, people can use it for illicit purposes. One of its downsides is that it is usually very slow because it goes through so many layers. If you decide to use it, only do it for legal things. Microsoft works with the NSA. Multiple reports from different sources claim that Microsoft works closely with the United States National Security Agency. A report from CNN on 2013 says that, quote, the NSA allegedly listened in on numerous video calls made via Skype, which Microsoft bought two years ago, and Microsoft also worked with the FBI this year to give the NSA easier access to its cloud storage service, SkyDrive, which has more than 250 million users worldwide. What do you think about this? Please let me know with a comment, maybe there is a chance that some stranger knows everything that you do from your computer. Solaris Solaris, it's a proprietary operating system originally made by Sun Microsystems in 1992, but then became the property of Oracle, being renamed as Oracle Solaris. It has a monolithic kernel, comes by default with GNOME, and is intended to be used on Spark systems. It is part of the System 5 family of Unix-like systems and has an open source variation called Open Solaris. Abandoned Apple Stores Some Apple Stores, mainly unofficial ones, have been abandoned, leading to some interesting pictures with empty stores and being in an unmaintained state. Android Never Released Android Never Released is a website where people can submit their concepts of future releases of Android. For example, you can find a page for Android 14. It tells you that the creator of the concept imagines Upside Down Cake being released in 2023, with the third names back. It features stacked widgets, a panic mode similar to iOS's lockdown mode, and improved lock screen customization with widgets. They even made a page for its Easter egg. This wiki is not exclusive to Google's OS. It also has concepts for other ones, and I would recommend you to visit it if you're bored. It's really interesting. Android Mandela Effect a Mandela Effect is a phenomenon where people remember things being a certain way, but when you check, turns out they never were that way. A good example of this in Android is related to emojis. There are people that remember emojis that never existed. For example, a rover emoji that could look like this, or like this. There was never a hiker emoji, nor a peace emoji either. Linux is obsolete.
This refers to the grid and divide that Andreas Stuart Tannenbaum, the creator of Minix and Linus Torvalds had in 1992, with Tannenbaum claiming that Linux was obsolete because it is a monolithic kernel and that microkernels like the one Minix has are far superior because they offer better portability that means that they are easier to port to other architectures. The debate with each reply became more complex and a little more intense, with some people thinking it was the flame war. Linus sent an email to apologize, but the debate is still alive to this day. You can read all the replies in the link in the description below. Linux has a divisive community. If you've been present in the Linux community, you might know that it can be a little bit divisive. A lot of people are always arguing what distro, desktop environment, package manager or text editor is the best. Some of them think that it makes them superior or something, but unironically. Some examples of this are Linux Mint vs Ubuntu, GNOME vs KDE Plasma or desktop environments vs Tile and Window Manager in general, Pac-Man vs. Apt, and Veeam vs. Emacs. Cancelled phones and projects Most of the times, we do see projects and phones getting released. Some succeed and some fail. There are some times when we won't ever know if it would have succeeded because they got cancelled before even getting to some significant production stage. We begin with the Essential Phone 2 that would be the successor of the first Essential product. If you didn't know, this was a phone company made by Andy Rubin, one of the founders of Android, and promised to have stuck Android phones with a lot of updates and openness. However, the company got shut down before ever releasing a second phone. You're seeing images of its prototype. There were plans for what is believed to be even an Essential Phone 3. The most interesting Essential prototype would be the Essential Gem, which is this smartphone with a ridiculously tall aspect ratio that looks more like a TV remote and we don't even know if it ran Android, but it had a card-focused UI. Samsung's Project Valley consisted of a phone with two screens. One was huge and the other one was very thin. It seems that it was from some years ago, judging by the design the phone has with capacitive buttons and running touch with. One very interesting and unique phone was the Mimix Alpha that had a display that wrapped all around the phone except for a vertical bar where the cameras are. On the side, you would be able to see your status bar as well as the volume level. On the back, you would see your widgets. A futuristic phone but it had some important issues, mainly regarding durability and false touches detection. Finally, we have to mention not a phone but a pro Project. Google's Project Era proposed phones that had modular components. For example, if your camera broke, you would just swap the old module and swap in a new one. This would also allow you to upgrade components easier, like the storage or the battery. A great proposal that I wish could have succeeded, but it ended up being cancelled due to expensive ports and heavy, bulky phones. But I wouldn't be surprised if the real reason why it got cancelled was because other companies were sabotaging the project. I mean, they don't benefit from it. Malo for 1.0.0 this is a creepy creepypasta related to the SCP Foundation. It is about a malicious app with the name of the entry available in stores that has no developer and is able to bypass the approval process, going directly to distribution. It cannot be removed by any program managers and after being installed, you won't find any icon or shortcut to open it. It will begin to send you images via text messaging every 3 to 6 hours including this creature. Eventually, the messages you will get will include pictures taken at locations near you, these pictures will cause you to have visions about the entity and the only way to get rid of these effects is to stop exposure to the pictures prior to 90 hours after installation. Linux in Space on February 19th, 2021, NASA landed a rover called Perseverance on Mars after surviving a 7-minute plunge through the Martian atmosphere because there was a delay of 11 minutes between Earth and Mars, so it had to deal with it with a set of pre-programmed instructions. 
along with Perseverance, there was another invention, the Ingenuity Mars helicopter, whose objective was to become the first powered flight on any other planet than Earth, and it runs Linux, so now you can say that Linux made it to Mars. Similarly to Linux, Android has gone to space. A PC World report claims that in 2012, NASA was planning on sending miniature satellites constructed with Android-powered Nexus 1 smartphones. But two years before, in 2010, Google had already sent seven payloads to space to improve Google Maps and Google Sky Maps. They sent them with a Nexus S phone that recorded the space along with a bug joy toy that was included. Linux later. And Linux to run Windows apps we have Wine, but systems like FreeBSD also have their own compatibility layer. In this case they have one called Linux later, to specifically run Linux programs. It does not involve emulation nor virtual machines. This is mainly useful to run programs like Steam that don't have a version for FreeBSD, but do have one for Linux. Haiku. BOS was a non-Unix-like operating system created with the intention of being bought by Apple, who wanted a new modern operating system to replace the classic Mac OS. However, Apple offered less than they wanted and bought instead. Next, Haiku is the successor of BOS, but its open source was created in 2002 and has compatibility with the apps of its predecessor. It has a hybrid kernel and the default interface it comes with is called Open Tracker. Linux doesn't follow the Unix philosophy. Originated by Ken Thompson, the Unix philosophy states that you should try to always make your software minimalist, modular, and to make it do one thing, but do it very well. Instead of having a program that does a lot of stuff, but is not good at doing all of these things. The Linux kernel doesn't follow the Unix philosophy because it's a monolithic kernel, which means that all the drivers are bundled into the kernel itself. It has the advantage of not having to install drivers, but it is also a bigger, more complicated code to work with. The default in its system in most Linux distros is systemd, that does not follow the Unix philosophy as it is more than just an init system. Access random Android webcams. There are some websites that allow you to get access to webcams, which some are powered by Android. Usually these are in public places and don't have any password, but there are some that could be in private property. I don't know how legal this is, even if you only access the public ones, so I will not share a link for the website and I don't encourage you to visit them. The way they get access to these cameras can be because someone willingly allows you to see their content, but some in other websites could have been hacked. So if you have a webcam, make sure to change the default settings at least to be protected. Windows kernel replaced with Linux. In 2020, Eric Raymond published an article where he says why he thinks that Windows will eventually replace its anti-kernel with the Linux kernel running all the Windows programs with a compatibility layer like Wine. As hints that this was going to happen, he says that the Microsoft Edge port to Linux is one of them, and also the Windows subsystem for Linux. This became news rapidly and a lot of people were actually starting to believe that Microsoft was going to replace the kernel. Some clickbaity articles didn't help at all. The original article is very optimistic, but there are a lot of issues if this was going to be done, because software like drivers are made specifically for the anti-kernel and wouldn't really work on Linux, so I do not think that it is going to happen at all. Temple OS Temple OS is an operating system designed by Terry Davis. It is heavily themed based on the Bible. He was schizophrenic and that led him to believe that he was communicating with God and that he told him that he needed to make an OS for God's third temple. So he started to work on the project. 
Temple OS has a 64-bit architecture with a monolithic kernel. Other characteristics that it has is a 640 by 480 resolution and a 16-color display. All of this programmed with a variation of C named Holy C. It is a very interesting piece of software that achieves things like 3D models in the file explorer with just text files. That is impressive considering the limitations that he had. Sadly, Terry Davis was hit by a train in 2018, leading to his death. He had some videos that were deleted but that have been re-uploaded by other users where you can see his progress and you can also see that he had a very interesting relationship with Linux because he used it as his daily driver but considered Temple OS better than Unix systems. System D System D is a suite of basic software for Linux systems developed by Red Hat. Among the main things it provides, we can find an init system and a service manager. Some people tend to really dislike System D because it is not just a replacement for the old init system, but it is more than that. As I've said, it is a suite of software, so it tries to change how everything is essentially organized. This is the main argument why people dislike it, because it tries to do a lot of things going against the Unix philosophy that it states to do one thing and do it very well. Some other people say that it is bloated and that is why they dislike it. Ubuntu causes girl to drop out of college. In 2009, a girl from McFarland named Abby bought an $1100 laptop from Dell to take online classes in MATC. The issue comes when she found out that it didn't run Windows, it ran Ubuntu. So when she tried to load the exe file from her Verizon CD to get Wi-Fi drivers, I suppose, it wouldn't load. Of course, because these kind of files don't run on Linux, they're for Windows. So she wasn't able to connect to the internet to take her online classes, forcing her to temporarily drop out of college. She also found out that the laptop didn't have Microsoft Office, but instead OpenOffice. That's why she called 27 News that reported the whole incident and called Verizon that told them that they would send a tech support crew to her house to fix it. This went viral and they even followed it up with a second part where they say that they got a lot of phone calls and messages from toxic Linux users that were insulting 27 News and Abby, with some saying that she was lazy and that this proved that she was not ready to go to college. She started getting her on Facebook and things got out of hand. The reporter even went to visit a technology consultant that showed him how Ubuntu worked and all that stuff. It is a little bit funny how the reporters react to this story because they try to paint Ubuntu as some sort of bootleg operating system and hassle. Fortunately, some people also offered to help her, so at least there is that. I mean, I think that it really wasn't the girl's fault because, believe it or not, this is how the average user would react, and I think that these toxic Linux fans shouldn't have her. Her. But I don't know, let me know your opinion in the comments. JPay JPay is a company that sells devices made for people in prisons. They ship them with a custom launcher, as expected, and they run very old versions of Android, which could be a double edged sword because they will not have a lot of modern features as they don't need them. But I guess that JPay's products could be more vulnerable to old exploits, which has actually happened before. Audacity is spyware. In 2021, a lot of open source news sites started to call Audacity a spyware because the new owner, News Group, was changing the privacy policy and implementing some telemetry features. Other news outlets have come out and they say that Audacity is not actually a spyware and that it was all a misunderstanding. The only data that it collects is the operating system name and version. 
the user country determined by the IP address, the CPU, error codes, and crash reports to improve the program, but the damage was already done, and some people still have some reasons to believe that Audacity is spyware. Personally, I still use it. I'm actually recording this video's audio with it. Linux from scratch Linux from scratch is a project that guides you with instructions to build your Linux system from source code. It is considered one of the hardest things a Linux user can do, even harder than Arch Linux, because you have to build all the components by yourself. It is only recommended for advanced users to try this. Most Linux distros aren't free. You would think that by just switching to Linux, you are now using an operating system that is free as in freedom, but no, actually most distros aren't free according to the FSF. Ubuntu? No. Has repositories of non-free software. Arch? Nope. It uses the standard kernel that has proprietary blobs. Gentoo? No, again, it has installation recipes for non-free software. SteamOS, Android, Debian? No, they all use the standard kernel. To use a free operating system endorsed by the FSF, you'd have to run Dragora, Geeks, or PureOS. By the way, it's not that related, but I just found out that if you contribute to GNU, you can get a GNU bug, which is just hilarious. <laughs> Tier 10. Steve Jobs' Behavior It is known that he had a pretty intense behavior sometimes, like when the time he didn't want to recognize that he was the father of his daughter and treating his best friend, Steve Wozniak, as a tool. Modded Bank Apps this entry refers to the belief that just by probability, chances are that someone has tried and probably succeeded to mod a banking app, to try to not be charged or to get more money. Of course, this has not been proven and it's not legal at all, so don't try it, but we've already seen a lot of tools that let you decompile apps and other ones like Lucky Patcher that modify programs to benefit you, so it could have happened already. Privacy and security focused Linux distros. There are two main privacy and security focused Linux distros. If you don't want to install anything, it's best to use Tails. It stands for the Amnesic Incognito Life System and is an operating system that runs from a USB, passes all the traffic through the Tor network, and when you don't need it anymore, just unplug the USB and everything gets wiped, as it all was saved in memory, not in your disk. If you need to install an OS, you could try out Cubes that containerizes all applications that you're using, making sure that it is as secure as possible, even though you have to have a very powerful system to run this. Linja's Toroboltos is your sauna computer hacker? This is a satirical article from 2001 where a parent discovers that his son uses an operating system called Linux, a hacker operating system made by a Soviet computer hacker named Linjas Toroboltos, and tries to warn other parents so that their children won't become hackers. The whole thing is worth reading it. It is still hilarious even after 20 years later. This has become a meme in the Linux community and there are copypasta versions of it. Android running on Androids The Cognitive Anteater Robotics Laboratory has created robots and creature-like robots powered by Android. They even shared the details of how they made them. Two Japanese companies called RT Corporation and Brilliant Servos created a bugger robot that took them about 60 days to be built. It can open its mouth, showing the device that powers it, and even dance. Linus's Behavior on Mailing Lists 
Aside from the Nvidia's middle finger incident, it is reported that Linus Torvalds could be a very rude person when people disagreed with him, especially when developers submitted patches that Linus believed that weren't up to his standards. In 2018, Linus took a break from his role of the maintainer of the kernel to learn how to behave better and apologized to everyone that he offended. One month later, he returned and decided to add a new code of conduct to stop developers from engaging in online errors. Rumored factory errors on purpose. This is a theory that states that some products made by Apple and probably other tech companies too are made defective on purpose to make you spend money on repairing it on an Apple store or by buying a new one. I think it's likely as companies like Nintendo, for example, has known that their Joy-Cons are defective and will get drift eventually, but they never really tried to fix that problem as far as I know. Probably the biggest counter argument for this theory is that even if they are defective, they have warranty so you wouldn't have to pay again. Lost Software it is believed that there have been apps and firmwares, mainly from Wish.com or very cheap phones, that have gone lost due to being so unknown or private. This entry also includes Android builds that never got released to the public and that are probably kept in some drive at Google. All of this is similar to the lost media concept but with software for Android. The Halloween Documents they are a series of leaked Microsoft documents released by Eric Raymond in 1998, close to October 21st. Hence the name. These documents contained information about how Microsoft was planning to deal with open source software on Linux, with these ones posing a threat to Microsoft's domination of the software industry. They were suggesting different practices to disrupt the progress of open source software. The authenticity of the documents has been discussed since they came out, but to be honest, I wouldn't really be surprised if they were actually real. It is known that Microsoft in that time really disliked Linux. Even the former CEO of Microsoft, Steve Ballmer, in 2001 said that Linux was, quote, a cancer that attaches itself in an intellectual property sense to everything it touches. Weird versions of Linux because everyone is free to modify and make their own versions of Linux, some people have made some unusual distros from funny to weird and creepy ones. I am going to mention just the most popular ones. Red Star OS is a distribution believed to be based on Fedora with the KDE Plasma desktop environment. It is made by the North Korean government and it is the only operating system allowed there and only to certain select people. There are multiple customizations to make it look like Mac OS. Some of its components are closed source, so people suspect that maybe it tracks its users and sends the data to the government. The website that hosted the ISO image is not active, so you'll have to go to any other site if you want to try it out. So, Linux it is a distro with a very simple purpose. If you enter any incorrect command in the terminal, it will run sudo rmrf slash star, wiping all your data. Amok OS in 2020, when the pandemic started, a lot of streamers made the game Among Us really popular, so much that the phrase Among Us became a meme, and this has led to the creation of Among OS, a distro themed like the game with a lot of references. It even has a custom NeoFetch icon. Hannah Montana Linux this is a distro based on Kubuntu that has a Hana Montana theme. That's basically it, but it is such a big meme that it is often mentioned in the Linux community. Apps with zero downloads. 
It is a fact that there are thousands or way more apps that have never gotten and probably will never get even just one download. This makes me think, what kind of content would these apps have? I mean, they could probably be your usual Candy Crush clone, but they could host very weird, probably unmoderated content that was missed by the Play Store's upload review process. Some of these are probably viruses. Keep in mind that the fee that you have to pay to publish all apps you want for a lifetime is of $25. System 5 It was one of the first commercial versions of Unix. It has been mostly discontinued with the exception of Solaris that fits into this category. It is said that there was a rivalry between BSD users and System 5 users but that most preferred BSD, leaving System 5 to a more business-oriented sector. Weird Microsoft Stores Apps or Games The Microsoft Store has some weird, low-quality apps and games that you can find if you look beyond the popular software that appears first on the home page, from clones of games to inappropriate content. I do not know if this is because the store barely reviews some of its apps, or due to the fact that the store has few apps, forcing Microsoft to accept most ones even if they have a low quality. The situation didn't improve that much with Windows 11, and there was a controversy as there were a lot of open source app clones that had a high price. Multics this is an operating system designed by the same people that made Unix, but earlier, and it was influential for the development of the latter. It stands for Multiplexed Information and Computing Service. It was very complex and had high resource usage, making it harder to run unlimited hardware. That's why they reconsidered this and created Unix, with simplicity as the philosophy they wanted to follow. NSA's attempts to backdoor Linux it is a well-known fact that we are being spied on with our own tech. Windows is closed source and we all know that it spies its users. Android is open source, yes, but the Google Play services aren't, and most Android phones need them to function properly, so it wouldn't be a big surprise that they were tracking us with them. Same goes for Apple, that even when it says that they don't track us, we can't really be sure because iOS and macOS are closed source. This is when you start to wonder if Linux has some sort of backdoor for any government agency like the NSA. Well, it doesn't, because if it did, we would have already found out. But that doesn't mean that the NSA has in fact tried to backdoor the kernel. In this interview, Linus Torvalds is asked if the NSA has approached to him and asked him to backdoor the kernel. Just see how he replies. Yeah, so this question, have, have any of you been approached by the US for a backdoor? <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, uh. Some say it was a joke, but others think it was real. Linus's father, Nils Torvalds, once asked the same thing, and he replied with the following. Almost posed the question when my oldest son was asked the same question, Do, are there, has he been approached by the NSA? Uh, about backdoors, then he said no, but at the same time he nodded because then he was sort of in the legal free. He had given the right answer and everybody understood that NSA had approached them. Google knows everything about you. This is a suspicion that I think we all have, but it isn't the lowest tier of the iceberg because it is not a conspiracy, it's a fact that can be proven. Go to your settings app, then to the Google section, tap on manage your Google account, there tap on the data and privacy tab. Scroll down and you'll find the data that this company has been collecting about you since you created your account. It saves whatever you're seeing from your feed, the Play Store pages you've visited, 
the notification sent by Firebase, at what time, if you have clicked on them, from what device and location. If you have location history turned on, which by default you do, Google will say for where you've been and for how long. All of this since you created your account, which can mean that they know where you were at three years ago. It is truly creepy tech, which can be used for good things like knowing where your phone is if it got robbed, but I think that the price to pay can be a little bit too high. Imagine if it was used to manipulate your political or social opinions. Of course, you can disable the tracking, but you will lose its benefits. Also, how do you know if it's really turned off? Like, there have been news of them tracking you even when you have turned it off. Just something to really think about. Android and W content. You know the internet and you know that rule. Well, it happened. There's that type of content related to Android, including Samsung Sam, Bugdroid itself, Sam with Bugdroid, and the Android 10. Uh, I had to apply multiple layers of Gaussian and then pixel blur to avoid getting this video demonetized and I'm still not sure if it will work. I won't mention any more details and for obvious reasons I won't give you the sources, just don't look it up. Touch ID does not work with calls. According to former Apple employee Timothy McSwain, Touch ID is capable of detecting if a person is alive by checking if there's a capacitive signal coming from your finger. Unless the person has died recently, you'd have to pass electrical current through their body to make Touch ID detected. Still, this is a pretty morbid topic. Andy Rubin's behavior According to the New York Times and other outlets, Rubin had a very toxic behavior towards his subordinates, thinking they were stupid. He also dated other women while he was married to someone else, pressuring a Google employee into doing inappropriate stuff I cannot mention. Also, some content was found on his work computer. Google quietly paid Rubin a 150 million stock grant and fired him with the condition of agreeing with a clause that prevents him from criticizing the company. iMessage is the deadliest software. Causing car crashes and in some instances, infidelities that end up really bad, it makes iMessage likely one of the deadliest pieces of software ever made. Apps with NFL content. NFW and NFL L content are not the same thing. If I wasn't recommending you to look up the first one, I wouldn't ever recommend you to look up for the latter. It is content so disturbing that can truly traumatize you to the point where you have to go to therapy. Some of it might not even be illegal. Unfortunately, there is always the possibility of apps or games having this content, mainly social medias. For example, some trolls can raid a Discord server sending these pictures, and they will get banned and removed, but the damage will already be done. Sadly, it is also known that there are obscure telegram groups where people gather to share this type of media and even encourage others to harm people or other beings and promoting them. If you ever have the bad luck of encountering any of these, report them immediately to telegram and also to the police. Bracer FS it is a journaling file system licensed under the UPL v2 license that was introduced to Linux in the version 2.4.1. One of the features it offered was tail packing, a scheme to reduce internal fragmentation. Why is this almost at the end of the iceberg? Because of its creator, Hans Razor. His wife obtained a temporary restraining order against Hans in December 2004, after he pushed her at the height of the divorce proceedings. She went missing on September 5, 2006, and later in October 10, 2006, Hans was arrested for ending with the life of his wife. Poor Working Conditions one of the reasons Apple has factories in China is because they can exploit workers more, leading to bad working conditions like employees working more hours than they should, causing accidents, bad mental health, and even eating rotten food in rat-filled dorms. Unfortunately, there is not a lot we can do other than refusing to buy their products. Steve Jobs' real cause of 
take this with a grain of salt, but WikiLeaks, a non-profit organization that publishes classified media, which in some cases has turned out to be real, published in 2019 that the real cause of Steve Jobs' death could have been AIDS and not cancer. I don't know, the decision to believe this is yours. Cruz's phone content and internet searches Cruz was a nasty person that did something at a school. He had an injured lollipop or marshmallow phone and its contents are publicly available. Don't look it up as it is reported to all be and all stuff. Over the horizon cursed ringtone Roni was a veteran that suffered from depression. He took his own life in a live video. His girlfriend was calling him, but he won't respond. All you can hear is his Samsung's phone over the horizon ringtone ringing over and over and over again. It is said that people that have watched the video can get awful memories and trauma by listening to that ringtone again. Well, finally, we ended this. If you're still watching, I don't know how to thank you. YouTube is going to become crazy with the watch time. <laughs> so if you watch the whole iceberg, I don't know, just uh, type some stupid stuff like I am the root user to see how many people actually watch the full video. Well, I'm gonna keep making icebergs, actually probably more frequently but I'm still not sure even though now that we're finished with the operating system theme I'm free to make an iceberg about every tech topic that I want so probably uh, the next one is going to be the AI iceberg let me know what you think I accept suggestions and uh, I also have some other options but we'll see thank you so much for watching Goodbye, see you in the next one.